left since six months. Uh, on inquiring further, she was apparently all right six months back when she incidentally noticed a lump in her right breast on self-examination, just behind the nipple while taking a bath. The lesion was about the size of a grape uh, initially when she examined it. It was in serious and onset and gradually increasing to the present size. It was not associated with any pain or any nipple discharge. No sudden increase in the size of swelling or any changes with menstrual cycle. No history of any fever, weight loss or malaise. There was no history of any headache, giddiness or dizziness. No as associated chest pain, cough, dyspnea or hemoptysis. No history of any abdominal pain, discomfort or distension. No history of back pain and no history of any similar complaints in the past. Uh, she is not a known diabetic or hypertensive. There's no history of bronchial asthma or tuberculosis, and she was not on any current or long-term medications. She underwent a co-biopsy three months ago and uh, when she presented with the swelling, and she was diagnosed with invasive ductal carcinoma and was advised neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And she underwent three, four cycles of uh, AC uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, following which she has presented to us. Uh, in personal history, she takes a well-balanced uh, uh, vegetarian diet. There's no history of any substance abuse. Uh, bowel and bladder habits are normal. Uh, she has no family history of any breast disease in her mother or her sister. No history of any BRCA-related malignancies such as prostate, colon, uterine or ovarian cancer in the family. Uh, as far as obstetric history is concerned, there is no history of any oral contraceptive cons uh, consumption in the past. She attained menarche at 12 years and currently is having regular menstrual cycles with moderate uh, The obstetric, uh, obstetric code is uh, Gravida 2, Para 2, Live 2 and uh, no abortions. The first child, uh, first child birth occurred when she was 26 years old. Uh, the child was delivered by full-term normal vaginal delivery and uh, the child was breastfed for six months. The second child birth happened at 28 years old, uh, when she was 28 years old. Again, a full-term normal vaginal delivery and she breastfed the child for six months. Uh, these are the clinical photographs. Shall I move on to examination? Yes, I think you have... Uh... It quite uh, okay. You can go ahead. But why was the chemotherapy there, sir? Uh, she uh, when when she uh, when she was uh, when she was present uh, when she presented with the breast lump, sir. A true cut biopsy was taken, and it was diagnosed as invasive ductal carcinoma, sir. So she was advised uh, chemotherapy for uh, for the uh, chemotherapy, and she underwent four cycles, sir. After that, she presented to us. Shall we have the discussion along with this or shall you have the presentation and then um, go to the presentation, I mean, Dr. Ashok's presentation and then we'll have the discussion. Is it like that or should, should I? I no, no. It, it is better to have a discussion yeah. now because uh, we will treat the presentation uh, as a sort of a uh, guest lecture. Okay. So fix that up. All right, all right. So I was just asking, I mean, what, why she had that anterior chemotherapy? What, uh, I mean, it was a small lump, is it? Sir, uh, it was a three by three centimeter lump, sir. Uh, it's a three by three centimeter when she presented to us right now. Actually, the patient presented after the neoadjuvant chemotherapy to us, sir. She did not primarily present to us. She presented to the oncosurgeon initially, sir. All right. So I think you have. Do you have any idea what? size that uh, presentation uh, ma'am she uh, she had reported that it was slightly larger but she did not exactly tell us how how large it was uh, ma'am i am not really clear about that okay. and smoking you mentioned no she had no substance abuse. no history of substance abuse i mentioned okay. no history of substance abuse can i go ahead with examination sir yeah yeah, you can. Uh, so, uh, yes. I want. Are you anything else? Is there any uh, protocol used to start an adjuvant uh, chemotherapy? Uh, Ma'am, it will depend upon. Uh, it will depend upon the uh, immunohistochemical uh, uh, profile of the tumor as detected by core biopsy, madam. Uh, invasive ductal carcinomas, uh, you recommend uh, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy before? Uh, uh, no, madam. We can uh, we can go ahead with hormonal therapy. Uh, hormonal therapy also, if if it is uh, e ERPR positive, ma'am. If there are estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors that are positive that are showing positivity, then we would prefer hormonal therapy instead of uh, chemotherapy. So that's so, what is there any criteria to follow like that? Uh, 
yeah because i mean we are not really onco surgeons because we will always be doing more, most of us unless we have any anyway, uh, we have special interest and we have taken a fellowship in breast onco surgery also we will probably deal with the onco surgeons and the oncologists opinion also isn't it so yes. but we should we should have a basic idea about what chemotherapy is why there, there is we are giving chemotherapy so as we are not giving chemotherapy or anterior yes i mean anterior chemotherapy for all cases so yes. that immediately tells us something about the staging that's why yes, I, I ask uh, sir in cases where we want to downstage the tumor prior to surgery then the, then chemotherapy would be preferred yes yeah but in a large breast with 3 by 3 cm most people if it is not uh, fixed to the chest wall or if it is not fixed to the uh, skin we usually don't use anterior chemotherapy maybe there are protocols which can use but we usually do not use i am not aware oncologically exactly i have only a vague idea so what i what i was asking is that uh, i mean should we know more about it do you know more about it that's why i ask not very clear for Mm. But basically, in a case, are you able to hear me, sir? Yeah, we are. Yeah, please, please, please continue. Please. Yeah, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. So basically, the neoadjuvant chemotherapy is done for a few reasons, sir. Number one, when it is an advanced tumor, when it is an aggressive tumor, for example, when they do a true cut biopsy and they find that it is a triple negative tumor. So triple yes. negative tumor means it's an aggressive tumor. The biology of the tumor is is very aggressive. They like can they also look at the KI sixty seven. You know the KI sixty seven is uh, somewhere around twenty thirty. Then it is a relatively a uh, less aggressive tumor. Suppose it is quite high. Say suppose it is somewhere around uh, 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 more than fifty. Then it is a much more aggressive tumor. So and next one is nowadays what they say is that if anything which has gone to the node. So that means no, it has gone outside the breast and gone into the axilla. So that time also, then they prefer to start neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Similarly, other than the other than the breast, if it is there in the skin or the and the chest uh, uh, wall, it also becomes a T4 lesion. So that again they start the chemotherapy. Now there is another uh, the role of a chemotherapy that has been started. Now, which is suppose if it is the if the lesion is around six into four six into three centimeters. Now beyond five centimeters, it becomes a T3 lesion. So two to two to five is T2 lesion. But beyond the uh, five means we have the T3 lesion. So then what they do is then they don't. It is very difficult to do a breast conservation surgery. So nowadays yes. people what they do is they give a neoadjuvant chemotherapy. downstage that you may make it much smaller in size and then they again and based on it then they now do neoadjuvant chemotherapy so these are the indications of a neoadjuvant chemotherapy either it is a chemotherapy or a hormonal therapy so uh, these are the reasons and uh, the lump and breast ratio also one as a uh, parameter they will uh, take in consideration more than 5 cm and uh, a lump breast ratio and triple negativity and uh, 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 invasive uh, locally okay. invasive procedure okay yes okay. okay. so one more thing i wanted to clarify was that um, yes as you said more than 5 cm we do give anterior chemotherapy but uh, if the tumor shrinks quite a lot can we really do breast conservation surgery in such a case even if the breast is large because we will actually have to remove the previous where the previous tumor was that has yes, to sir. be taken as the usual tumor and then we have to go for a margin isn't it so can we really do a breast conservation surgery there so studies have been done for it sir and studies so what they say is that when you, when you next to go for surgery you take the only the margin of the uh, the present tumor size sir so that is what the studies have done and then they have also uh, showed it sir and that is the reason why a lot of uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is being done especially by a lot of uh, breast surgeons basically to shrink the tumor and then go ahead with a breast conservation surgery because if not they have to go on for a, probably a mastectomy and a, and, and a whole breast reconstruction which a lot of them a lot of people are trying to uh, uh, not do it there are the uh, so, uh, 
Raja told her there are comparative studies deadjuvant uh, chemotherapy followed by breast conservative surgery and uh, mastectomy followed by radiotherapy. They have uh, compared the disease free, uh, distant disease free, and the uh, uh, overall survival rates. So there is no much difference. So that is the reason the importance of neoadjuvant chemotherapy has increased a lot uh, in uh, breast malignancy. So when 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 there is a large tumor that has been uh, detected and you want to downsize, what they actually do is they put a marker into that area and then okay. downsize it. So when you excise, you excise just that uh, area and you don't excise the original size of the tumor. You excise what is remaining. And uh, okay. sometimes it, there is complete clinical response. There is no tumor left at all. So then what okay. they do is they just remove about two centimeter around that marker and send it for uh, um, biopsy that is uh, frozen section. If it is yeah. negative, that is all that is uh, considered to be a, uh, a complete uh, resection. Okay. So one more thing, you, as you asked, uh, uh, when do we do uh, upfront surgery and when do we give neoadjuvant? The only indication for uh, upfront surgery now in breast is um, T1, N0 tumors in breast, which are ERPR positive and HER2 negative. So that is the only indication for upfront surgery. Now, almost all other patients, either they receive uh, hormonal therapy first or a chemotherapy first and then undergo uh, uh, surgery. So this is the uh, latest protocol the onco on oncosurgeons follow. Uh, for breast cancers. Okay, Dinakar. I'll continue, ma. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in clinical examination, the patient was examined in standing position in a well-lit room after prior informed consent. Uh, she was conscious, alert, cooperative and well-oriented to time, place and person. And her performance status as per Karnofsky's performance code was 90. She was moderately built and moderately nourished with a BMI of uh, 26. Her vitals were stable. The pulse rate in the right radial artery was 76 per uh, minute, regular with normal volume, rhythm and character. No radio radial or radio fibril delay. Uh, the respiratory rate of, was 14 per minute, thoracoabdominal and regular. No pallor, ictrus, cyanosis, clubbing or generalized lymphadenopathy or pedal edema was noted. Okay, Dinakar. Coming to systemic examination, uh, it was unremarkable, sir. Uh, the, 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 uh, the cardiovascular system, uh, respiratory system, uh, per abdomen and CNS, there were no abdominalities detected. Coming to local examination, on inspection, there was a slight asymmetry noted in the breast with the right NAC slightly higher than the left NAC. The right breast is larger than the left breast. There is a visible fullness of about 3 by 3 centimeters in the junction of the upper outer and upper inner quadrants of the right breast with the NAC. The skin over the swelling is not pinchable. There is no nipple retraction, dimpling or puckering. The under overlying skin appeared normal. There was no, there were no dilated veins, sinuses or everything on over the breast. There were no visible scars, no ulceration, pori orange or uh, satellite nodules were noted. Uh, coming to palpation, the inspectory findings were confirmed. There was no local regional rise of temperature. There was an ill-defined lump of size 3 by 3 centimeters involving the upper inner and upper outer quadrants of the right breast adjacent to the right NAC. The lump was hard in consistency with minimal tenderness and was slightly mobile and it was not fixed to the uh, 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 not fixed to the underlying underlying structures of the chest wall. Uh, in local examination of the right axilla, there was a single ipsilateral lymph node of size 1.5 by 1.5 centimeter palpable, firm in consistency and mobile. And in systemic examination, the thoracic spine, there was no abnormalities detected and pervaginal and digital rectal examination were normal. Uh, I have examined the donor sites also for possible reconstructive options. The abdomen was soft, non-tender. There was no organomegaly. There were no scars or sinuses on, over the abdomen. There was no evidence of malgains, bulges or swelling during leg raising. A pinch test was done and the abdominal paniculus was found adequate. Uh, there were no scars of trauma or surgery over the back and there were no scars over the thigh. To summarize, 
the patient is a 48 year old premenopausal female presenting with a progressively enlarging breast lump in the right breast since 6 months with no history no family history of carcinoma diagnosed with er uh, er positive pr positive her2 new negative invasive ductal carcinoma by true cut biopsy and post four cycles of uh, atriamycin and cyclophosphamide chemotherapy on examination she was found to have an ill defined hard tender minimally mobile lump of size 3 by 3 cm involving the upper inner and upper outer quadrants of the right breast adjacent to the right mec fixed to the skin but not to the underlying structures or the chest wall with a single hard mobile 1.5 by 1.5 cm lymph node in the axilla uh the core biopsy report was provided to us sir. so uh, uh it was uh, it it was an invasive ductal carcinoma grade 2 er positive pr positive her2 new negative with a ki67 of uh, 45% activity my diagnosis is a 48 year old premenopausal female with carcinoma of the right breast clinically stage 3b uh, that is t4 uh, t4b n1 m0 with core biopsy proven invasive ductal carcinoma which was er er pr positive and her2 negative yeah, there's a good presentation that only one thing that you need to add in this especially in terms of a reconstruction is you have to also look at the dosage of the breast so okay. i think that is the that is something that you have to because if it's an extremely tortic breast then yes. i think that plan also keep changing so the ptosis of the breast also needs to be taken into account but otherwise a good presentation uh, yeah. so regnolds classification yeah regnolds classification good so uh, according to regnolds classification what is it uh, so grade 2 this will be said the uh, the okay. in, the nec the nec is below the level of the from amri crease okay this er pr positive can you just tell me a little bit about that and hr2 new maybe that uh, sir uh, er pr would uh, mean that the uh, uh, that the carcinoma uh, carcinoma has estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors sir so mm-hmm. the uh, if we provide hormonal therapy there would be a chance that the uh, carcinoma would involute her to so new it's a good prognostic yes sir it it is a good prognostic the node in the axilla you said there was a clinically a node no yes sir was it assessed by in any way uh sir uh, only during definitive surgery did they uh, they had not done a prior That's assessment fine. only a clinical assessment was done sir for this patient would you do a central lymph node biopsy Uh, sir, there is already an established carcinoma, so uh, it, it, an axillary lymph node dissection. Uh, carcinoma can... only are doing as a, as a for breast cancer only are doing central lymph node biopsy. Yeah. For this case, will you do a central lymph node biopsy, and why? Uh, sir, there is a clinically positive lymph node already, sir, and uh, the true cut biopsy has already proven a carcinoma, so there would not be a role for central okay. lymph node. So central lymph nodes are done only when you, when you don't have a when you have a N zero axilla. Yes. Good. Yeah. That's good. But possibly so, they must have done an ultrasound, no? The axilla, no. So, uh, no, sir. They have not done in investigations with respect to ultrasound. Yes. So, is uh, is uh, four cycles of chemotherapy okay so for the as a new treatment chemotherapy? Are the are the oncologist happy and then sending it to you? uh yes sir after that the patient was uh, sent to us for uh, sent to us for the definitive procedure so they are planning okay because usually this kind of a sandwich uh, program because some some people what they do is they give four cycles of chemo then do surgery and then give four cycles of chemo some yes. people, some some oncologists give eight cycles of chemo and then go for surgery yes, so both are acceptable so this fine so now what will be your plan Yes, sir. Uh, with respect to management, I would like to do investigations for anesthetic fitness, sir. Uh, complete blood count, renal profile, a coagulation profile, and serology. And uh, as, uh, as part of metastatic workup, I would like to do a contrast enhanced CT of the thorax and upper abdomen, as well as a bone scan to rule out bone metastasis, sir. Then we would prepare the patient up for surgeries. And uh, sir, I, I've just included the mammogram picture which was given to us, but it was reported as Byrads one. Uh, it might not really be significant in management. Sir. 
I've just included for completion of the discussion. Okay, so how does mammogram help in, uh, in in this case? Of course, in this case, it may not be so, but uh, uh, how does the mammogram help in deciding whether it is a BCS or, or a, a total mastectomy? Uh, depends upon the involvement of the tumor with respect to the size of the breast, sir. Can you hear me? Hello, sir. Hello. What uh, what he was asking was that um, yes, does the mammogram help in any way or change the uh, diagnosis or the treatment or the decision in any way? Does the mammogram? How does a mammogram help? I mean, audible, what you are asking? Um, yeah. Yes, yes, Raja, you are audible. Yeah, Raja, you are uh, audible. Sir, uh, it, uh, the extent of extent of tumor involvement as detect, uh, as uh, uh, delineated by the mammogram would help us in deciding whether uh, whether it is a breast conservation surgery that we are doing or uh, whether it would be a mastectomy in terms of the involvement of the amount of breast tissue, sir. And there are yes, some sir, other... multiple microcalcification. Yes, sir. Multiple because uh, multiple. diffuse microcalcification. If you have diffuse microcalcification, then you cannot do a PCS. PCS. It won't be uh, do a mastectomy only. And, yeah, the other thing is, especially in younger people, if you have it's a very dense breast and if it's a lobular carcinoma, then there's a higher chance of multicentricity. And that time you would err more in the terms of a mastectomy rather than a BCS. BCS, yes. yes. Okay. And uh, to assess response post chemotherapy, a uh, mammogram can be repeated, sir, uh, to assess, uh, assess uh, response. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so uh, my management would be uh, to do a modified radical mastectomy with axillary lymph node dissection, followed by a primary total breast reconstruction with a deep inferior epigastric artery perforator based flap cover, sir. Okay. I mean, can you consider BCS in this? I mean, of course, the oncosurgeon also is to be involved and uh, we discuss and do the uh, decision making. But what I'm yes. asking is, is BCS possible here? If so, why and why not? Uh, sir, uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of the tumor size at present, sir, the size of the tumor is still three by three centimeters. So with a one centimeter, and, and there is skin involvement also, sir. So in terms of uh, in terms of resection, if we were to include uh, include margins also, the defect would be substantially large. In which case, a local uh, a local oncoplasty would actually distort the breast and uh, and would not be a uh, would, would produce a suboptimal income in terms of cosmesis. So then, a mastectomy with a uh, deep inferior epigast epigastric flap might be uh, might be able to uh, uh, help us achieve both cosmesis as well as symmetrize it with respect to the opposite. Really? Okay. So for example, so yeah, Raja. So you told that's a three into three centimeter tumor. So it won't take yes, one sir. centimeter on all the sides. It will become five yeah. into five centimeter. Yes, sir. For so five centimeter, five centimeter, you can probably even do a Tdap or a, or a, or a LD yeah. or something like that. No, you, you, you can, can have enough volume. Yes, sir. So you can do a BCS. Mm -hmm. It's a large breast. If I mean, why not? Why are you? I mean, what what, what, what else? What else did? Other than other than the feasibility of doing the BCS, what else determines whether you, you can do BCS or, or a total mastectomy? So the grade of the carcinoma also said uh, this is grade three, uh, uh, grade three pathologically. So uh, it would and the axilla is all the, there is axillary node involvement also said. How, how does that uh, determine? Um, what do you want to Uh, it, Anything it is patient, on, patient related factors, uh, sir. Uh, if in case the patient uh, the patient wants uh, wants a total breast reconstruction, uh, if the patient wants to retain the retain the breast and not go for a uh, not go for uh, not go for a reconstruction which involves a, a free tissue transfer, then we would uh, prefer to uh, prefer to try and do a BCS, sir. Okay, and. Not sure, sir. Any, anything else you do with BCS? Anything else is needed with BCS? 
sir a lower tumor grade uh, no no now after bcs do you do anything as compared to a sir, mastectomy uh, sir yeah. adjuvant chemotherapy chemo radiotherapy sir the acceptance of the patient towards adjuvant chemo radiotherapy sir chemotherapy radiotherapy 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 radiotherapy, radiotherapy. 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 Yes. so right. what uh, my question is anyway this at this stage with the probably positive node and that with this size she will have to have undergo radiotherapy yes sir yes sir so in with bcs also she will have to undergo radiotherapy and yes. so bcs is also an option isn't it even yes. oncologically oncologically and depends on the patient's the discussion with the patient and the oncologist isn't it what do you yes, say sir. other yes, other sir. yeah i think so so the difference the difference between uh, radiation uh, after pcs and the radiation after axillary clearance is that um, after pcs you give radiation both to the breast and the axilla if, if axilla is positive but yes. in in case of axillary positive uh, axillary node clearance almost all the radiation is only to the the boost is only to the axilla so that's the difference some of the patients uh, prefer i mean don't prefer giving getting radiation done to the chest so that's uh, an indication for you to decide this yes, uh, is basically uh, if if uh, medically you can do both it's the patient's wish what you need to uh, yes. uh, agree for whether it is yeah. going to be mastectomy or a bcs that's what uh, yeah here i think both bcs and both are possible because both are possible, possible i feel and especially with such tortic breasts if she's if she's happy with the bcs uh, we we should give that option also to her possibly because it doesn't really compromise her um treatment and you can suppose it's a, we are doing a bcs and as you said there is a large uh, hole you know the skin large skin defect and uh, large substantially large around 5 into 5 cm as raja said defect there why why did you say it was difficult to reconstruct why how would you reconstruct that then uh, no sir a volume displacement oncoplasty would not really be an option there sir because there would not be enough locally available tissue to move into the breast yeah i we agree, agree. Do, yes sir we would we, we would need to do a volume re, uh, replacement oncoplasty which would involve a local flap sir which one sir uh, the defect would be uh, in in the upper outer quadrant and uh, uh, upper outer quadrant and upper inner quadrant sir so uh, possibly we could do a uh, either a thoracodorsal artery perforator based flap cover sir or a latissimus dorsi or a latissimus dorsi sir or a latissimus dorsi myofibrillar so shri kumar dinakar sorry yes sir um you, ca you can't do a, a volume uh, a displacement in this any special volume displacement technique you can use especially in the tortic breast like this yeah sir uh can you first of all say like in inner mammoplasty okay yes sir we heard of the contralateral uh, sir uh, we, yeah, we can simplify like yeah, the contralateral uh, contralateral breast we can uh, uh, we can do a reduction mammoplasty so that uh, sir this breast uh, both the breast are symmetrized a therapeutic yeah. mammoplasty so, yes So, in, in terms of volume uh, uh, displacement and volume replacement, you do a few things that you must always consider. You no, know. if you are doing a volume replacement, the volume is almost the same, so there's no problem. But if you're doing a volume displacement, many times what you have to do is the the breast becomes smaller in size, and hence you have to do a uh, the symmetrizing operation. And volume displacement mostly you will prefer for larger breast because it, so that it doesn't give much of a difference yes, between sir. both the breast so in terms of volume displacement and volume replacement now as sir, sir told uh, uh, what are the different volume displacement techniques that you can think of i think in the, the as you told it is in the uh, is in the uh, 12 o'clock position isn't it yes sir 12 o'clock sir okay so what are the what are the different volume displacement techniques you know of local uh, local oncoplasty 
pixels. Another thing, for usually for upper tumors, there's a back wing, uh, back yes. wing uh, oncoplasty is there. Okay, and yes. you can do this. Uh, this uh, round block Benelli's approach also can be done. So these are the uh, things that you just need to know because in each quadrant there are some small small uh, techniques in which you can do a local technique. But having said this, for this case, I also will not do it because it is quite a big tumor. I have to take a five into five centimeter uh, uh, defect will be there, and I would preferly use a volume displacement technique volume only. Volume replacement. If at all, so the so volume replacement technique only. If at all, I do it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Even I would actually do a LD flap with muscle, in this, which can very yes. nicely fill the hole. Yes. So you went into a mastectomy. What are the different types of mastectomy that you know of? Uh, a radical mastectomy, a modified uh, radical mastectomy, sir. Uh, so I think you know, nowadays a radical mastectomy is almost gone it's off not, nowadays. Yes, yes, sir. It's modified. Radical. Mostly now, what they, what we have to think about is whether you're going to take the skin, is there a skin sparing mastectomy or a nipple yeah. sparing mastectomy? Nipple sparing mastectomy. These are the so questions. You know, indicates no peach. Yes, sir. Uh, when will you do a nipple sparing? When will you do a skin sparing? And when will you will do a, a modified radical mastectomy where you remove the skin also? Sir, in case of skin involvement, then it becomes necessary to include that in the tumor excision margin, sir. So then, uh, then we uh, then we need to do a modified radical mastectomy, sir. Okay. As in this case, sir. Uh, if in case it is not fixed to the overlying skin. And it does not involve the nipple, then we can uh, then we can do a nipple sparing mastectomy, sir. So how far from the nipple should it be? So for a nipple sparing mastectomy, what they say is it should be at least two centimeters from the nipple. Two centimeters from the nipple. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Sir. Not involve the skin. Not involve the chest. Yeah. One two centimeters so, away from the nipple. Yes. Nipple. Yes. Yeah. And the skin sparing mastectomy, you can take the nipple off. Only the skin nipple. alone. Remains. So the skin is a uh, nipple is uh, closer. The yes. tumor closer to the nipple, then you can do a skin sparing mastectomy. Retroareolar masses, uh, retroareolar masses, which are uh, yeah. Fixed, good, good. yeah, and the, there are other things also involved. I mean, uh, for practically speaking, I think uh, what we need to understand is that suppose in a small breast you are doing a skin sparing mastectomy, even only the nipple area is taken out, and you are doing as much of the skin as possible. It is advantageous for us, isn't it? So yes. you can think of maybe a uh, implant or an LD LD lip implant, or even a, even if you are doing an abdominal flap, it gives a much better um, yes. you know, aesthetic appearance yes. when you do yes. a skin sparing mastectomy. Secondly, yes. practically speaking, what we I think we need to know is that that nipple sparing mastectomy, most of our amateur surgeons, many of them may be reluctant to do because traditionally it has been and it is it is not till now if you look at the literature also it is not 100% clear in what situations you can really take out the nipple and uh, not uh, take out the nipple so in that way also there is some confusion but if you can really uh, preserve the nipple and areola nothing like that okay yes. and some but there is another one more th very important thing in, as regards uh, skin sparing and nipple sparing in this kind of large breasts which are very tautic, I think nipple sparing is not possible because the nipple is not going to be vascularized. So you will need to take out some amount of uh, uh, nipple and some amount of skin because the distal most part won't be perfused. That's another practical point. So in this uh, reconstruction, you gave your option as a DF flap as your first choice. Yes. Uh, can we do? Can we do implants here? Uh, yes, sir. And uh, latissimus dorsi myocutaneous flap can be combined with an implant to reconstruct uh, reconstruct the same breast, sir. Then why why didn't you put that as your first choice? Sir, autologous reconstruction would be preferable uh, preferable as the first option in this case, sir. And why, the why? patient has. Uh, so uh, the patient has a sufficiently large abdominal paniculus which uh, which can be utilized sir and post operatively uh, the post operatively she has to receive radiation also sir yeah so I then think that's an the autologous that yes, is your sir. answer should be yes sir that's so, the first answer yes sir autologous reconstruction would be preferred because post operative radiation is uh, going to be there 
suppose dinker if yes, the sir. pathology report come as lobular carcinoma yes sir how you would have progressed sir uh, lobular carcinoma is generally multifocal and multicentric within the same breast sir okay so uh, so we would have to do a modified radical mastectomy even in that case sir and and uh, uh, sir, and uh, the reconstructive uh, the reconstructive option would have been uh, my reconstructive option would have been a deep inferior epigastric uh, flap even in that case, sir. Okay. What about the other breast? Uh, sir, uh, uh, sir, uh, in this case, the abdominal paniculus was uh, uh, the, was sufficient enough to re uh, sufficient enough in terms of volume to reconstruct the entire breast, sir. So probably uh, uh, symmetrization, uh, sir. But uh, we need to uh, we need to rule out uh, rule out any pathology in the other breast also, sir, because it is multifocal and multicentric lobular carcinoma. So what is the commonest you will see? Sorry, sir. What is the commonest condition in which you will see both sides? We look for the other side. Uh, Okay, sir. Okay. People get it done, no? Uh, sir, BRCA positive, BRCA, BRCA positive uh, patients, sir. Positive. Uh, uh, BRCA positive. Sorry, sir. That is what I'm asking you. Yes, yeah, sir. BRCA positive. Uh, BRCA uh, positive. Uh, positive. Sir. Got it. So in the deer flap, no, is there are different zones, no? What are the zones? Uh, so they actually told for tram flap only, but uh, yes. in the, what are the different zones? I think in the exam they may ask you. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, uh, heart ramp and homes have described four zones of perfusion, sir, depending upon the location of the pedicle. So the zone which is immediately in the vicinity of the location of the pedicle is zone one, sir. Mm -hmm. That is home zone one. The uh, uh, the uh, homes. Sorry, sir. First, you tell tram, a uh, hard tram, uh, zones. And then you tell yes. homes. Don't combine both. It'll become confusing for a lot more people who are listening. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, hard tram zones. The first, uh, the uh, zone one is the zone in the immediate vicinity of the pedicle, sir. Zone mm. two is the contralateral, uh, contralateral, uh, contralateral side uh, uh, closer to the midline. Zone three is the ipsilateral side, which is. Same side of the the ipsilateral the ipsilateral extreme the extreme side of the flap, sir. And zone four is the contralateral extreme side of the flap, sir. Okay. And so uh, this is perforator. So yes, sir. so that's what we because that uh, hard tram zones are based on the medial perforators. Now medial home zones are the lateral perforators. So now you can the lateral uh, home zones. Uh, home yeah, zones, sir. Yes, sir. Home zone, the uh, zone one is uh, uh, zone one is in the immediate vicinity of the perforator, sir. Zone two is the ipsilateral side, uh, ips ipsilateral side. Zone three is the ipsilateral mid uh, uh, median uh, medial uh, medial aspect of the flap, and zone four is the uh, contralateral extreme side. Good. I mean. Uh, one thing is uh, what I what I was asking is that of course in the clinical examination, we you didn't say about the breast measurements, isn't it? Maybe the opposite breast measurements and all that. Is it uh, yes, sir. really I, I, required? I am yes, just sir. putting it I, out because see okay. in the future you are probably going to get a lot of many breast cases because already people have started putting breasts and um, brachial plexus and all that. So. Suppose is it required or not? That's what I'm asking. It's an open question to everyone of, our, of the examiners also. I was asking, you know, the base diameter and the external notch to nipple distance, the nipple to IMF distance, and all that. Should we measure and say, or is it expected of a candidate? But if we're looking at implant, implant based reconstruction. Yeah, but in plan based, we cannot continue completely rule out. Not in this particular case, may may not be. But yeah, for for a student for the examination, I think it is safe safer for yeah. them to uh, examine. Even I was thinking that both the breast. 
so all yeah. your uh, findings were on the right breast which had the lesion but yes. there was uh, yeah uh, the left breast was not mentioned i think it's good to uh, good to uh, have a measurement yeah. and uh, um, examination of that as well uh, even if it's yes. negative omas yes. and things like that should be and axilla should be examined so to complete the examination yes. Yeah, I think then we need that base diameter, what is called the breast width, maybe, and the sternal notch to nipple distance, and uh, maybe the nipple to intra IMF, intra inframammary fold yes. distance, and uh, these kind of distances. Maybe upper fold skin pinch you can mention, just mention, you know, because these yes. are the, now the standard things which people say in breast examination. So these things at least you should maybe okay. say. Okay. And the doses also, which Raja had already. Yes, sir. the doses, Dragnol is great. great. So, what are the, why do you prefer a, 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 a DF flap and compared to, uh, say, uh, other uh, autologous reconstructions like a duck flap? Or what are your other. Uh, other autologous reconstructions, and why do you prefer a DF flap? Uh, so the other reconstructive options would be, the, uh, as you said, a uh, transverse upper gracilis flap, sir. Uh, super, uh, a superficial inferior epigastric artery uh, based flap can be used, sir. Then mm -hmm. uh, the profunda artery femoris uh, flap, uh, a pap flap can be can also be used, sir. Uh, but the volume of tissue that is provided by all of these uh, uh, all of these flaps might actually fall short in large totic breasts, sir. So in this case, uh, it, it might not be able to replenish the lost volume volume as such. Sir. So then my choice would be a deep inferior epigastric flap because uh, uh, the extent uh, the extent of the abdominal paniculus can be entirely excised and used for reconstruction. Sir. If there is a perfusion problem, there is also a possibility that we can uh, either turbocharge or supercharge the flap. Sir. So then the flap, uh, the pedicle is much more reliable. The perfusion also would be much more reliable in case of in case of the flap. Sir. And beveling outside will enable us to ex, uh, enable us to uh, take much more tissue as compared to a tug flap or a, a tug flap or a saya flap. Sir. Good. The saya flap you can take only if, uh, you should not cross the midline in a saya flap. That is yes. one thing that you need to know. Yes. You never cross the midline in a saya flap. Yes, the advantage sir. of the CR flap is that you don't even need to uh, open the rectus sheath at all. So yes, sir. Here in terms, of thing, yes, sir. Uh, in terms of thing, and the other thing is that in the CR flap, the, uh, the artery sometimes goes into spasm, and 15% of people, it is not there at all. Yes, so sir. these are the uh, other things are there. But having said that, uh, if you're uh, so doing a bilateral case many times, we would still go for a, a CR flap, especially when the uh, perfor DF perforators are not good and the CR uh, uh, is big enough, bigger. Yes, then we yes. would go for a, a CR flap. Yeah, flap. And as you tell, uh, told the other things like uh, and the PAP, tug, they are yeah. quite small. You probably yes. need to do two uh, two flaps if you have to do uh, to make a large breast. Large what breast. about the, uh, the things from the buttock? The S gap and I gap and all. I gap, uh, S gap and I gap flaps are also described for breast reconstruction, sir. The, uh, but the, they, uh, they all give a good volume, no? Yes, sir. sir but the quality of tissue is uh, is much more different, sir, with, with respect to the fat in the buttock and uh, the fat in the breast. The, uh, the the quality of the quality of the tissue it will not replace like with like, sir. So uh, the abdomen would be a preferable option. Yeah, so the thing is, the, the fat in the buttock is much more harder and firmer. Yes. The next yes. thing is, uh, the, in the gap flaps, the pedicle is quite uh, shorter and there are so many branches, yes. it's more branches. difficult to, to do it. Yes. And the other thing is that you need to uh, put it in the back. So you yes. need to have a position change, which, yes. is, uh, which can be difficult in terms of this thing. And in terms of if you're going to do a gap flap, then what happens is that unilaterally, if you do it, then there could be a change in the way the buttock looks and it may not look that great. Yes, sir. So these are Asymmetry. points for, yeah, mm -hmm. points against an S gap flap. S gap flap. So, yeah, so similarly for even the lumbar artery perforator flap, it also gives a good volume. There can be some mild asymmetry 
there are higher rates of uh, seroma in case of a uh, lumbar artery perforator flap and yes. again the the pedicle is very short and you almost always need to have a uh, you, you need you need to put some vein grafts or artery grafts to uh, for the uh, pedicle so these yes. are the uh, reasons for the lap flap yes okay so you told that you you can do the uh, um uh, uh, pedicle ND along with a uh, uh, an implant, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. So, what are the disadvantages of it? So, one, of course, you have all the problems of an implant. What are the, the problems of an LD? Sir, donor site morbidity is relatively high in uh, high in an LD flap. Sir, we would have to take uh, we would have to take a large uh, the large skin paddle because the extent of resection here, uh, in terms of the skin, also would be large, sir. So then the the you know, suture line in the back would have a lot of tension and it would tend to hypertrophy with time. The chances of seroma in the back also with an LD flap is relatively higher, sir. So uh, and it would also because of the volume of uh, volume of fat and muscle resected, there would be asymmetry in the back, which would be anesthetic as well, sir. OK, yeah, so I think the, the thing would what most people talk about LD is it has a lot of a seroma rate, but yes. having said that, we a lot of us do a LD and we don't get that much. But anyway, the most common thing that has been told for an LD is a high serum rate, right? Yes. So, what will be your choice of your pedicles, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of each? Uh, in this patient, your, I would like. Yes. What is your first choice, and then uh, you can tell about the other choices. Sir, uh, in this patient, the ch first choice would be an internal memory uh, internal memory uh, artery perforator, sir, okay. uh, for anastomosis because the uh, vessel size match uh, size match is uh, similar. Uh, I mean, the size match is uh, sir, the size uh, the size match is good. It is an easily uh, accessible vessel, and uh, uh, when we uh, when we uh, when we orient the flap. Uh, there would be the the anastomosis would the anastomosis would, uh, the, the anastomosis would uh, actually lie towards uh, lie towards the surface and uh, in perforator you're talking or the main vessel you're telling uh, Shri Kumar? It's sir, uh, the perforator uh, the perforator would uh, the perforator of IMA. No, the main the, the the main vessel itself would be a good match to the DM. Yeah, usually the the main yes. vessel is matched to the yes. uh, yes. Yes. vessel. Yes. Perforator rarely, rarely a second yes. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, yes. intercostal. Yes. Sometimes might be, but yes. it's yes. the uh, main vessel. So is it easy to would be a good size match? Main vessel is easy to access. Uh, sir, uh, within the intercostal uh, within the intercostal space, we can access. Uh, Uh, the disadvantages of IMA. We, we would have to uh, we would have to uh, we would have to excise a portion of the rib for the vessel to come to the surface. Not necessary, but if you have to uh, uh, excise a portion of the costal cartilage, some costal. people may have some mild pain, My and they say they say if it is not well covered by the flap, you can also have some defect, but they are minor ones. Uh, what is the other major one? Say, especially on the left side. Uh, sir, uh, if the patient has undergone any uh, prior uh, prior procedure, they might have harvested the uh, harvest, uh, harvested the internal mammary arteries. No, mostly what they say is if you're going to do it with the, the left, especially on the left side for IMA, it yes. may not be available for a CABG later on. CABG later on. Yes. But having said that, there are there are other options for CABG Option. like sucking up, long sucking up, swing graft and, and things like that. That is one thing that has been uh, told. The other yes. thing is that there are when, when you are going to do uh, use an IMA, there are chances that you may also uh, uh, have a uh, pneumothorax. pneumothorax. If, you, if you're not very careful, you can have a pneumothorax. pneumothorax. So yes. they, they are hydrogenic problem. Right. Having said that, over the most commonly used pedicle is the internal mammary artery pedicle. Yes. Which is the next one? The thoracodosal pedicle can be used. Sir. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, but uh, the uh, advantages of uh, them. Uh, 
uh, sir, the advantages uh, advantage is that it is usually uh, preserved even in a radical uh, a modified radical mastectomy. So it is a, uh, a pedicle that is easily available to us, sir. But the disadvantage would be that the anastomosis would actually lie deep within the axilla, where it is technically more difficult to do an anastomosis as compared to a much more superficial uh, surface lying vessel uh, like the IMA. Sir. And, uh, yeah. The other thing is that uh, if you're going to use the uh, LD pedicle, then suppose if you fail, no, your yes, your sir. most the second choice is usually the LD flap. You yes, actually sir. lost the choice. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. That choice. That's an, another thing that you need to take into account. And yes, the other sir. thing is that you're doing a DF flap, no. So when you're going to certain to put your pedicle, there should be no twist and turns. So yes, which sir. can happen, especially when you're looking to do uh, an anastomosis deep in the axis. Okay. Then, then the next commonly done is the IMA perforator, which yes. uh, is very good, except that the, the vessels are very quite small. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the main vessel would be a better size match to the deep. Good. So, what are the complications of it in the flap, and how will you manage each of them? Uh, sir, one common complica uh, one common complication uh, may be a uh, hematoma, sir. Very good. In which in most which case, we, so, sorry, sir. It is the most common complication after DF flap is hematoma. Hematoma, yes, sir. So uh, uh, hematoma uh, would uh, a small uh, the, uh, a larger hematoma will need uh, a emergent surgical evacuation, sir, because it would compress the pedicle and compromise the vascularity of the flap. Uh, the second, uh, uh, the other complications would include uh, problems with flap perfusion, sir, because of thrombosis. So thrombosis will again need emergent, uh, emergent surgical exploration, thrombectomy, and probably a reanastomosis, uh, reanastomosis if it is at the anastomotic sites. Is there is there anything specific for diap? What he was asking is, as compared yes. to a free tram. Or uh, if you do a tug or a flap, as compared to all these flaps, does diap have any specific complication or a specific uh, problem that you anticipate and you take care of it? Um, sir, uh, sir, with respect to uh, uh, with respect to position. Uh, because the flap is relatively huge and uh, affect the vascularity, uh, sir, it would affect the vascularity if there there was a positional change and it would tug on the pedicle, sir. That would uh, that would that that would apply to any flap, right? Yes, unless you take yes. care of it. Yes, sir. Uh, sir uh, does it one, have? Uh, yes, sir. Sir, uh, the problem is that the venous drainage is usually not represented by the uh, venae committantes of the uh, deep inferior epigastric pedicle, sir. So uh, uh, it might be uh, representative more uh, more by the super uh, superficial inferior epigastric veins, sir. Okay. So, uh, so there is a uh, there is a high up? chance of uh, venous congestion in the flap, sir. So how do you take care of it, uh, sir? Uh, preemptively, if we uh, if we find the superficial inferior epigastric vein and if we can uh, uh, if we can super drain the flap by doing an additional venous anastomosis, sir, then the venous drainage of the flap is much more reliable as compared to uh, anastomosing only the venae committantes of the deep inferior epigastric artery. Sir. Can you preempt and find whether this will happen or not happen anyway? Yes, sir. Sir, we can clamp. Uh, we can clamp the superficial inferior epigastric uh, vein preemptively, sir. Uh, and once, uh, uh, once, uh, once the uh, once the flap uh, flap is divided, if the uh, if the uh, superficial inferior epigastric vein is very turgid, sir, that uh, represents uh, that. After the flap uh, is divided. Uh, sir, prior to the flap, uh, prior 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 to flap division, we clamp uh, we clamp the vein also, sir. The deep inferior epigastric vein, also, sir. Basically, when you're doing a, a DF flap, no, yes. you should always have the SIEV. Uh, you should know, use it the signal that you have a bit of the SIEV. And yes, when sir. you're almost uh, finishing uh, harvesting the DF flap, if you see that the SIEV is turgid, yes, 
okay and that yes. means now that that thing uh, want help and it needs a drainage Drain. especially this sciv with more turgid in the contra lateral aspect not yes. in the or lift lateral aspect sixth yes. lateral aspect usually it will be okay it is a contra lateral aspect it is a place where you have more amount of venous problems venous problems okay yes can 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 you preoperatively predict this um uh said uh intraoperatively no intraoperatively is, is there anything we do before doing a diaphragm sir uh, ct so, ct angio sir ct angio yeah. uh, preoperatively mm-hmm. to Uh, assess the caliber of the superficial inferior epigastric vein, sir. Uh huh. Anything else uh-huh. we can see? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. A good CT angio. Yes, sir. You will be able to pick up the communication between the deep system and the superficial system. Okay. Sir. In such cases, you will uh, you might not need to do a, a super. training of, of the flap super, super training okay, okay. Uh, so but if there is no communication then uh, you might need a drain super training. having said that you always harvest a vein you never uh, yes. even when you see a good communication you always harvest and keep and only if necessary you can use it you can use it maybe. yeah that's another thing which we did, need, did not cover we, you know looking for perforated preop investigations yes. which are required or not yes. previously we were never doing it only by exploration now yes, we have started you know what are the ways of looking at the perforator uh, said by pre-op- doing pre operative uh, uh, ct uh, uh, ct angiogram would tell us the exact location of the perforator with respect to the umbilicus sir what are the other options and uh, advantages hand- and disadvantages sir uh, sir a handheld uh, 15 megahertz doppler can be used to uh, uh, used to identify the uh, identify the location of the perforators clinically pre operatively sir so that would uh, guide us to uh, guide us to the location yeah. of the perforator the disadvantage is low sensitivity and low sensitivity and specificity yes sir. yeah and then color doppler is there isn't it color doppler would uh, indicate the flow characteristics also sir and mm. indicate vessel character but it is also still not uh, this thing. definitive and you yeah definitive because uh, it has been shown that ct angio is better all right yes sir yes but there is an advantage to there is a mr angio also which some yes, people sir. have started doing but there is a disadvantage to mr angio ct angio is better uh, perforate is better shown by ct angio Yes, sir. But uh, there is an advantage and disadvantage. There is an advantage to MR angio. What is it? Higher you don't need to have that. Yeah, you need, don't need to do that uh, with the contrast. You don't need to give the contrast yes. in MR angio. Yes, yes. No contrast. Yes. Uh, yeah. Plus the that much of radiation is avoided. Avoided. These are the questions which people can ask. Uh, having said that i am not sure whether every center is doing ct angio we were we are not routinely doing ct angio i don't think most centers in india are doing routine ct angio like that we have just started doing ct angios so Maybe. so the advantage of ct angio is that you um, can identify few things one is the communication between superficial and deep system in the venous phase of it you can identify which perforator to use so you can plan your skin paddle around it third is in the theater you will uh, waste less time because every perforator you get when you harvest the flap you will be thinking whether to use this or not to use this so uh, you will waste more time in the theater if you don't have a ct ng um and uh, lastly if you are solely reliant on handle doppler if the perforator is slightly oblique post you might land up in trouble uh, uh, um, without knowing where it started and where it is ending so um, in our uh, unit we routinely do ct angio for everybody and uh, as you said ct angio is better because we can read it mr angio we need the help of the radiologist to uh, uh, we have to go there talk to them and all 
and uh, CTNGO is very easy. Uh, the films are there on the system. You can go and see how far it is and how many are there perforators and uh, you can uh, mark them yourself and you can reconfirm with your hand and doctor. So double confirmation can be done with that. Another thing which uh, I think we did, did not cover and about in this is that you said immediately you'll reconstruct. So it's a, you use it's a, you are opting for a primary reconstruction. Primary reconstruction. Why not a secondary? What are the pros and cons of each? Why not secondary? I mean, what are the things which you which will prompt you to do it primarily? What are the things which will prompt you to do maybe only secondary? Uh, sir, one uh, one uh, thing is patient preference. Sir. If the patient wants the breast to be reconstructed in the same setting, then uh, then then we should probably go ahead with primary reconstruction because the uh, the other option would be a psychological impact on the patients the patients' well being, sir. Uh, the next thing is, uh, uh, sir, post operative radiation. Uh, since we are giving a flap cover, would probably uh, be much more safer in terms of uh, safer in terms of. Uh, post-operative radiotherapy also if lap cover is also covered. I'm not sure about that because I think uh, the current literature is a little bit iffy about both of these things because okay, sometimes sir. you know our as reconstructive surgeons we want it to be done primarily and plus it is easier for us to do primarily. When you look at yes. the functional outcomes maybe two three years down the line when you look at the functional out outcomes there are yes. differences of opinion which says that Correct. if you think that radiation is required or will be required in late stages, I mean stage three and four, uh, I mean three, three and all that, there is a, quite a lot of people right now saying that you might need to consider maybe secondary reconstruction rather than primary. Primary. So. Well, basically, it's done, it depends upon the unit which with uh, each one belongs to the person. Some people are not capable of doing the uh, 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 immediate, then they would rather prefer delayed. Then the most of the oncologists would say that you don't need to do immediate reconstruction, you can just do it, uh, you can do it delayed and so on. So it's basically a more of a, I think both can be done, sir. And uh, in fact, the, the better outcomes are given, better outcomes are always given by an immediate reconstruction rather than a delayed reconstruction. But uh, it also depends upon the facilities and the place in which you, yeah. they, they come from. And depending upon yeah. which, there is a paper which, which is produced, sir. Okay, okay. That's good. That's great. But what I'm saying is that even now in many centers, especially in the UK and centers where uh, it is... They, 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 do, they do that, sir. Of are there. Yeah, they may not do primary. Some will prefer it secondary. A lot of cases are done secondary. I believe. So, so, so in, 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 in Japan, they do only prime, uh, secondary reconstruction. They do a mastectomy and send the patient, they finish the radiation, but all of them will receive uh, a tissue expander first, they expand yeah. the uh, skin, and then go and do the, the reconstruction. It all depends upon local uh, facilities available and uh, what they are used to. Um, but with the patient, we need to discuss both the options and it is their choice ultimately to take because yeah. it's a non-essential reconstruction. So yeah, uh, patient's yeah, input yeah. also makes a huge difference, uh, uh, difference in what we can do for The so one thing that I wanted, you know, other than complication, I'm looking out for fat necrosis, no? Because in the yes, in, yes. in, 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 in primer, all these things, you get a lot of, you might get some uh, lump after the uh, DF flap has been done. Yeah, so then the people are actually very scared, especially when you have a lump after the DF flap. So yes. how do you deal with it? Uh, sir, uh, uh, we can uh, we can investigate it's with an ultrasound. Not, it's only a fat necrosis. Sir, uh, an ultrasound, uh, an ultrasound would, uh, would be it's the first. Them are yes, sir. Is also so, In short, how would you basically follow up by imaging wise a reconstructed breast, which is the best way to follow it? Of course, you would do it clinically. Yes, sir. Imaging wise, which is the better options. Okay, 
okay so as you told said no you can do it by different means one by mammogram itself will show a mammogram is will be especially a fat necrosis is more spherical it is got more rounded and similarly in a, in, a, in a mammogram it will show speculated margins if it is a tumor <laughs> and in a ultrasound ultrasound no and similarly you will, uh, cancer will be very irregular while this one will be more rounded in uh, shape <laughs> then, um, the confirmatory thing is always a biopsy yeah yes. okay Yes, so I think MRI so may be slightly biopsy. better than other imaging to before doing a biopsy. Many a time an MRI can better delineate the flap, where's the flap, and the recurrence and all that. It's, of course, biopsy is the final answer, but we do not want to biopsy every single small nodule appearing on the flap or you think that there will be fibrosis, there are going to be areas of lower blood supply, with some things and all that so but all this requires quite a bit of experience the, the same team which you are working you may need to i mean these are quite thorny problems after you work on this so shri kumar can can you can you prevent fat necrosis in any way not sure. okay i mean how do you can you can you um, identify the hyperperfused areas from why why does fat necrosis happen yes sir uh, sir uh, that is because of hy hyperperfusion uh, hy hyperperfusion within the flap sir uh, intraoperative mm -hmm. in green studies perfusion studies can help delineate whether uh, whether a portion of the flap is being hyperperfused sir mm -hmm. And uh, if the volume is more than adequate, then preemptively we can remove those areas so that fat necrosis can be prevented in the future. Okay. So do an uh, ICG uh, study and remove hyperperfusion. Anything else, uh, sir? Okay. And uh, in terms of in, in in terms of enhancing the flap uh, flap perfusion, we can uh, we can uh, choose to, uh, we can choose to include more uh, uh, more areas into the perf in, into the perfusion radius by doing a supercharging or a turbocharging. Sir. Suppose you want to do only one uh, uh, pedicle. Yes. Sir. Anything else you can do to increase the, the chance of uh, the perfusion or increase the perfusion? Uh, sir, uh, uh, an intraflap anastomosis, sir, a turbocharging. You need another pedicle, right? Where does the pedicle come from? Yes, we are using single. Yes, sir. So you can include more perforator, perforators, right? Instead yes, of one, yes, you yes, need yes, on yes, one. Yes. You can do more than one perforator. Uh, yes, sir. And if you're doing that, how would, you choose, how would you choose? Any idea? Uh, sir, uh, based on uh, uh, based on the caliber uh, caliber of the perforators. Perforators of that in uh, so the perfusion angle. Simple thing. Does lie of perforators determine what you want to take? Yeah, uh, sir. A, a, a more uh, a more oblique lie would be uh, less favorable in terms of perfusion, sir. No, no, no. More linear. Uh, perforates which are lying in the same line so you don't damage more of your or, okay, rectus okay. yes sir yes sir. right okay, your sir. medial set of or lateral so you can't take one lateral and one medial. one lateral okay yes, sir. Uh, that would uh, destroy most of your muscle uh, right if you muscle, yes sir yes. So, so you need to use the same, same, yeah, same line which yeah. are in the straight line so that you right. don't damage too yes sir How would you insert the flap? Where would you hitch it? And how would you uh, shape it? Sir, uh, pre-operatively uh, pre we need to uh, we need to mark uh, we, uh, we need to mark where the upper pole takes off from the chest wall, sir, the breast takeoff point, and the inframammary crease, sir. That would be the limits to which we need to hitch the flap in order to uh, ensure that the shape of the, the shape of the breast mount remains uh, conserved, sir. So, yeah, so once it's you can take it in the 
you know upper okay. upper lateral place place yes. where the pectoralis major uh, kind of comes out and the yes, second sir. stitch yes. where will you take the second stitch in the upper pole sir or in the low i mean in the upper pole you have already taken the next yes, stitch the crucial stitch at the inframammary uh, at the position of the inframammary crease sir which is uh, marked here. yeah so that the, uh, in, so at the at the anterior axillary line at the anterior axillary line and then and uh, stitches can be taken uh, taken within the breast tissue itself to uh, give it a more uh, uh, give it uh, give it uh, give it more curvature sir so that it mimics a normal breast mount as compared to the flat abdomen uh, abdominal panniculus that we have sir mm. how would you i mean would you give it slightly more or less than the other side or would you match it exactly how would you want to do it um it might be more prudent to over correct a little uh, a little as compared to the opposite breast to uh, take into account for a contraction during uh, normal scarring sir okay but at the time we need to look at the vascularity also which are the yes. well perfused areas so it's a compromise but if you yes. can you can maybe over correct a very tiny amount but it's actually difficult so it's yes sir Mostly, you try to match it to the opposite side. Opposite. By yeah, yeah, opposite side. By looking at the from the foot of the table, table. and uh, getting the table in a forty-five degree angle. Forty-five degree angle. And then. Yeah, and you uh, you can look at it. But uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is that when you do primarily, that pocket is already made for you, isn't it? Yes. So that may be larger than the required. No? Maybe larger than the breast base, really. So, yes. how would you? Or suppose it is a secondary reconstruction. How would you make the pocket so that it is really in the breast base? Any way in which you can do that? So, by measuring the uh, breast weight, uh, uh, breast uh, base width on the contralateral side, sir, we need to extrapolate it, uh, extrapolate it exactly to the uh, uh, the the unreconstructed breast also, sir. Mm. That would give us the uh, that that would give us the medial and lateral limits to which we need to hitch the flap in order to achieve the same shape. Sir. And uh, as far as the vertical limits of the breast are concerned, the inframammary crease would give the inferior limit, and uh, the breast takeoff point would give the superior limit. Sir, by comparing the uh, upper pole fullness on uh, on the contralateral side, we need to ensure that the flap is hitched uh, in the uh, hitched to to the same level on the other side, sir. So yeah. that would. Uh, yeah, that's why I asked you. Whether, um, I mean, about the breast measurements and all that. So yes, it's not that they are not totally relevant. They can yes, be uh, important. All right. Would you keep the inframammary fold at exactly that same level or slightly different? We would keep it at the same level, sir. We can keep it at the same level, but maybe you can keep it very slightly higher. Yeah, yeah because you are doing an abdominoplasty also now here, so you are you are so the, pulling yes. the whole thing down. Yes, yes, at the entire. So if you keep it around around 0.5 to 1.5 centimeter, one centimeter higher, it may slightly yes. pull down. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, but in a case where the abdominal, uh, sir, the donor side closure is also in tandem with the flap inset, sir, then how would we make that consideration, sir? Be because the abdomen would have already closed, and so the contralateral inframammary fold would also have been pulled. So, yeah, I mean, you just make it arbitrarily slightly, very slightly high. That's all. Yes, sir. So one That's is all. you make it high. The other way is. You almost you try to uh, uh, pinch it and then you almost try to put some towel clips and see where it goes, okay. and then yeah. uh, you can uh, arbitrary you can uh, symmetrically just cut off that extra skin. So that yes. is also a method we can use. Yes. Yes. Yeah. See, contrary to the implant, uh, where you know you are inserting it through the submemory approach or the inframemory yes. approach. Yes, sir. But you mark the inframemory crease compared to the opposite side. Opposite side. But 
don't make the crease there, isn't it? You make the yes, crease sir. about a centimeter below. Below, yes, sir. But further below, because by the time you create the pocket for the uh, implant to slide in there, and then yeah. you start suturing, yes. it migrates upwards. Yeah, migrates upwards. Yes, sir. Yes, correct. Sir. Yes, true. Sir. That, true is sir. The, that is the difference. So oh, always, true. always, what happens? The operative incision will come straight away, right on the on, breast. The on uh, the breast. Yes, so sir. So if you keep about a centimeter below, whenever you are yes. implant. Whenever you are doing the implant surgery for the implant breast, implant it will exactly come into the inframemory crease, in which you memory. probably think, yes, that is the right size. Correct? Yes, yes. So there yes. is a bit difference when you are doing a flap cover when you are doing for the inframemory crease. Inframemory crease. Compared yes. to the implant crease. Implant yeah, crease. The <clears throat> principle is same. Okay. Sir. Yeah. All okay. right. Now, suppose this patient was a. Uh, I mean, uh, she needed mastectomy. This particular patient, this particular breast patient, um, with the same type of breast, this size and ptosis, she uh, say it's a stage two, early stage breast cancer. But she has yes. to undergo breast uh, mastectomy because of uh, various, yes. uh, I mean, other maybe multicentric disease. Yes. And but she wants. Basically, implant reconstruction. How would you yes. go about it? I mean, just, just wanted to ask you because you know, even we don't do a lot of implant reconstructions. And my experience yes. is also limited, but you know, this is one of the options. How would you go about it? Uh, sir, uh, if she wanted an implant based reconstruction, uh, one option that we have is to do a myocutaneous uh, latissimus dorsi flap with an implant, sir. Wherein the LD would provide the uh, the LD would provide the skin cover, which would uh, 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 which would cover uh, which would cover the implant, sir. How would you insert it? Where would you? Is it submuscular, sub? Sir, uh, uh, sub uh, a sub a submuscular plane would would be the only option, sir. Submuscular and uh, but there are some. How would you? There are uh, expander first, and then you can put the implant on. In yes, sir. Sir, if the patient wants a primary a primary reconstruction, then uh, I would advise a latissimus dorsi uh, latissimus dorsi flap with an implant, sir. If, however, the patient uh, wishes uh, does not want a primary reconstruction or secondary reconstruction, then we can preemptively put a tissue expander, uh, do serial expansion. Expand the skin pocket, and then later on, uh, later on we can uh, uh, probably uh, 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 probably uh, probably put a uh, put, put an implant alone in the subpectoral plane of that patient. Sir. Yeah, there is uh, another way also. We can use uh, in the pectoralis major, and you can use use the. Raise that serratus also, serratus yes, and pectoralis, is. and make it completely submuscular. And yes. there are expanders uh, which you can use Please. and then expand it. And yes. but but what would be the primary thing which pre-op you would you would want to know in these patients whether they need need to undergo radiation or not? Radiation or not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If post-operative radiation is planned, then an implant-based reconstruction. A reconstruction is less optimal. Less Definitely optimal. less optimal, but there are people who apparently there are people who do it, do even in a radiated field and even when radiation is required. But it is definitely there are complications up to 30 to 40 percent of complications have been reported. So that is that isn't really a good option. But if yes. we are sure that radiation is not going to be there, yes. implant reconstruction is definitely an option. Yes. Yes. So yes. there are. There are three methods of implant reconstruction to have an immediate primary implant yes, or an sir. expander and then later implant. And later implant. Yes, sir. Okay. These are the things which you should probably know. Yes. And uh, we need to know that uh, a lot of people are doing implants. Yes, sir. So we should not always be thinking only autologous because yes, there sir. are uh, a lot of implant based reconstruction. I mean, yeah, and uh, we should know the basics of implants and implant reconstruction because yes. a lot of people are going to do it whether we would like i mean what's the advantage advantage is that what is the advantages of an implant or a dive or an autologous 
um, sir, uh, uh, one thing is it is possible to match the volume almost exactly to the uh, opposite breast, sir. Because we can. Only the contrary, actually. On the contrary, actually. It's just, just easier to do. Yes. Basically, it is very much. It is quite easier to do, but okay. uh, we should not. We should be careful about that too, because see, a lot of surgeons, breast surgeons are going to come out. A lot of people are going to do a lot of things, and these are also going to be in the, uh, you, you know, out there, people yes. offering everybody all these. So we should also be able. To, you should also know uh, what are the advantages, disadvantages, when you can use, when you do not use, things yes. like that, and you should. You should be capable of offering it when required. Yes. Uh, but in this particular case, then we would have to do a master pexy on the opposite side later, things okay. like that. And how we would choose an implant, what size. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's relevant here, even if you are not doing cosmetic surgery that much. Even in reconstruction, at one yes. point of time, you may have to do it. Yes. In terms of how, uh, I mean, what uh, what are the other disadvantages of doing a, a implant based reconstruction? Uh, and anything with anything uh, with uh, how how the reconstruction would go with, with time? Uh, sir, uh, I I didn't get the question actually, sir. As compared to an autologous reconstruction. Yes, sir. an implant based reconstruction. What happens yes. with time? Uh, sir, the breast does not sag as compared to uh, as compared to the uh, as compared to the contralateral breast. Sir. Yeah. So, so uh, the aging aging process yes. is not aging so much is not in, so apparent in the reconstructed breast. I mean, uh, in the breast which contains the implant as compared to the contralateral breast. Sir. So, yes. so later so on, if time, be, but there is more yes. asymmetry that develops over. Yes, uh, no, if you have to wear Yes, sir. And, and uh, the advantage is there is no donor site morbidity, which yes, 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 no morbidity. Absolutely, it is. Yes, yes. 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 That's a big advantage according to some patients and some people. You know, some patients will insist that uh, no donor site is violated. Yes. Sir. Else in business. Any any idea about I mean, do we need to look at the breast volume and breast volume assessment and implant? Because I got I got a message saying that can you discuss about uh, implants and, and and you know breast volume assessment and all that? But is it really uh, relevant? Do we measure the breast volume at all? pre-op and uh, in these kind of in these patients we do not know we don't there is no but I, there is no reliable method to do a proper volume assessment yeah. of the breast uh, some people have tried with uh, ct and mr and things like that and it's very very uh, cumbersome and is expensive to just to get the volume of the breast and um, one of the things what uh, we can do is measure the volume of the resected specimen of breast yes. or the weight of the breast what has been uh, removed to the weight of the uh, 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 tissue you have from and you can match that which roughly gives uh, similar volumes it may not be exactly the same that is one and second thing is if you are looking at putting uh, an implant you can actually measure the volume of the the resected breast by doing a water displacement because anyhow you are discarding it and you can use that volume as a reference point for you to put an implant. But uh, um, uh, these are still whatever you do. Ultimately, it's not exact. It will be similar to what you can achieve. That that's very close to what you would want to achieve. You can reach. So at present, it is not practical to do a volume assessment of the breast to reconstruct it. There's, there's a paper from South Korea where they did this. The, they measured the volume of the breast 
and they measured the volume of the tissue they want to take from the abdomen and they took only that much of volume from the abdomen to to prevent abdominal uh, complications as well but i think these are all for centers where they are only uh, breast reconstruction day in and day out for uh, this thing and probably that's that's where more more of an investigative tool on uh, than than routine tool for for us mm-hmm. there was a similar uh, uh, situation in a benign conditions in which they did for the uh, breast reconstruction for hypoplasia so when they did the autologous fan transfer you know exactly how much is the volume we have achieved afterwards subsequently they kept on doing various volumetric measurement but nothing came to a very satisfactory uh, level but for probably mri in uh, various sections they found that probably that due to some sort of a mathematical correlations to the amount of volume which is expanded but still as dr ashok says there is absolutely no satisfactory method to uh, measure a breast volume and i think we routinely do not do any volumetric measurements in uh, breast reconstruction else so, can you summarize in short what are the uh, options of a breast reconstructions in a case of a ca breast and how do you arrive at a hand rule uh, said we can uh, the options would be immediate reconstruction or uh, delayed reconstruction so primary or secondary reconstruction of the breast sir okay uh, if in case the patient uh, uh, if in the uh, it depends upon patient preference uh, tumor staging as well as the need for post operative uh, chemo chemo radiotherapy sir and uh, in primary and second uh, in the secondary reconstruction also we have either autologous reconstructions uh, or uh, or uh, uh, alloplastic reconstruction sir okay and uh, autologous reconstructions would include uh, would include fa- uh, fla- uh, would include either uh, 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 flap uh, flap cover or uh, minor corrections in in terms of uh, autologous fat grafting can be done sir and uh, in in terms of in, uh, alloplastic reconstructions we have implant based reconstructions which may or may not be uh, may or may not be combined with flap covers Anything else, Jimmy? You want to add into the? <laughs> and uh, I think yeah, yeah I think it is done, and uh, we have nicely. He has presented very nicely. Thank you, Pinker. And uh, we have c- covered much of breast reconstruction, but I I am sure that uh, we would be uh, slowly seeing more of breast reconstruction coming into our practice, especially diet because the BCS and other things maybe. the surgeons will start doing more and more that's what we think and but we need to know and a lot of i mean interested people probably should come to breast reconstruction from plastic surgery side also like in, involve more in you know do short fellowships in breast oncology because unless you go into the oncology part also and team up with somebody good you try get into the primary section also and treatment of breast tumors also maybe a lot of this oncoplasty and um, these kind of things will slowly go out of our this thing. but then it is probably in our hands to uh, learn more about diap flaps and free flaps and ways to reconstruct in a autologous uh, with autologous tissue very nicely very beautifully and very um, reliably then lot of patients we would get in that line there is yes. no doubt yeah and it will it, it is a you know this this type of patients where as patients are getting more affordable as our um, centers are getting even from the government setup are becoming more and more developed 
I'm sure breast reconstruction is going to expand. And that that's go, some one thing which is going to increasingly come to our as plastic surgeons. And definitely it will be kept in exams too. So I think we have covered fairly well. Actually, one of the major uh, obstacle was the insurance. The insurance people never used to cover the cosmetic, uh, I mean, they used to consider plastic surgery as a cosmetic surgery, like a waterline. And then they never used to consider uh, covering the expenses from the plastic surgery aspect of it. But I guess I think nowadays most of the onco reconstructions, they are well covered under insurance. I think that is also one of the reasons as to why this uh, uh, increase in the number of cases and then probably coming for reconstruction is on the rise. Any inputs, Dr. Ashok? From your side. Ha. Before we no, go I think uh, <laughs> we covered everything nicely, and uh, I think um, some of it will be reflected in my whatever we discussed will be reflected in what I speak now. And um, there's nothing else to add. Uh, most of most of the points, which as a student, what needs to be done as an uh, for examination case in case you in case you get one, very very unlikely, but overall view of uh, how reconstruction should be done and what are the options available uh, for the plastic surgeon is still covered. I think that should be good. Dr. Lakshmi. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, it's a really wonderful discussion and uh, what all needed if the case is kept in uh, exam or uh, it's a uh, very, very nice discussion of uh, covering all the points, sir. So uh, I thank for all the uh, people who has participated in this uh, discussion, case discussion, and very well presented by Dr. Dinakar. Um, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, sir, would you like to add anything? Uh, Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Denkar has presented very confidently and very nicely. He has done full justice. Uh, yes. Only few points I would like to uh, put from my side is that if RT is uh, contemplated, that means radiotherapy, then I think it's better to avoid the implant. This is uh, my experience. And uh, the other thing is that uh, when the examiner asks a lot of questions about complications, maybe I feel that uh, the candidate is uh, does do not have that much of experience of complications unless he has seen it. But uh, I, I, I feel on the other side that most of those complications has been faced by the examiner. And therefore, he, he or she can enlist the whole list of complications many a times. It's not a theory, it's more of a practical, this is what I feel for any such surgery. So the examiner may not expect uh, that the candidate will uh, list all the complications. The one thing which I, I just wanted to ask is that uh, how do you uh, convince the patient uh, for primary breast reconstruction? Because uh, patient comes that we, uh, I want to be free of uh, disease. And then uh, uh, the surgeon talks more about reconstruction because he, he knows that he will be able to uh, take care of the uh, lump or the lesion, followed by chemotherapy, radiotherapy, all those things he will explain. But the patient is interested in that part. Now, when you talk of primary reconstruction, how do you convince the patient? And uh, how much do you explain the procedures to the patient, the, the way we have discussed the various uh, methodology available? Because if you, to my mind, for any reconstruction, if you over explain to the patient, patient runs away. There is a phobia. Uh, so how much do you speak? How do you convince the patient for primary reconstruction? That is a very important part uh, for uh, the reconstructive surgeons, especially what we are discussing. So, uh, can, Dinkar, uh, can you just uh, highlight one or two points that how will you convince, especially in Indian scenario? Uh, sir, I would uh, I would tell the patient that a flap cover would provi uh, provide a robust, uh, uh, a robust skin cover so that subsequent uh, post-operative radiation also will not 
uh, cause too many complications. Sir. The rehabilitation that the patient gets into the society is much faster because of an immediate reconstruction as opposed to a delayed reconstruction where there would definitely be a deficit on the part of the patient. So I would advise these two points to the patient to, to yeah, convince them about reconstruction. Whatever reconstruction, we should not over explain to the patient. This is my experience because they don't understand all those technological terms and we cannot simplify much. Yes, sir. So, <laughs> so you have to, you know, adjust these two points. Uh, this is a very practical thing. Yes. And if for the, say, say general surgeons or because breast is de uh, dealt by many types of people. Uh, so uh, to convince okay. our colleagues is also important. And in uh, government sector, the uh, constraint of operation time because uh, you know there's always constraint in operation time as compared to private sector or yes. oncology also. so yeah we have to convince our colleagues also in that question so yes yeah, so what we do is that we see the patient on the day one sir, and what we found is that 70 percentage actually opts for some, some form of reconstruction sir we just put three photos sir one is the total mastectomy done other is whatever reconstruction we want that photo we also put either you can be like this or you can be like this. We, uh, we think it will be better. Some people look at this and then they say, I would like to be 30% uh, say mastectomy itself they want. And they take it, sir. But 70% actually say that they would like to go for this. If the finance is not a problem and if we are uh, either we should become cheaper or uh, they are more affordable, mostly they go for it, sir. I think I think the best way is to show the photographs of some of the previously operated patients and not to discuss much about the technicality. Yes, and then it's more easily convinced because what if we say 20 sentence, a good picture will immediately catch their mind. So I think that is more convincing. In any case, in any case, whether if you are doing a hypospedius or a syndactyly or whatever it is. In any case, if you show the photographs, so I think we should always sit with the you know laptop in front of you and show them the photographs. This is what I do personally in every case. So you need to have good documentation of your previous cases. And now with the smartphone, sir, you know, all these photos are in, the, in our phone itself, sir. So we just show it in the phone. Only, Whatever. Sir. It's a phone or a laptop. It's, it's in, in it becomes area. much more easier now, sir. Yeah, yeah sure. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things which we didn't cover, Dinkar, was the nipple areolar reconstruction. Yes, sir. Yes, Somehow, sir. unfortunately, during our breast reconstruction, it is always incomplete without an NAC uh, reconstruction. But I think Dr. Ashok is going to talk about it. Our numbers are fairly less whenever we are considering doing the NAC reconstruction compared to the number of uh, breast reconstructions we do. I think the most of the reason probably we can ascribe is that you know they they are quite happy with the volumetric replacement which they have got after the ablation of the cancer I mean uh, surgery and then uh, they are quite happy with the appearance and they just don't want to do anything more. Yes. Exam moderators, with your all permission, shall we? Thank you, Dr. Anantheshwar, sir, and Dr. Ashok, for, uh, Jimmy Thomas, and Dr. Raja for wonderful discussion. And now I invite Dr. Uh, uh, Ashok uh, to deliver the guest lecture. Is a uh, uh, having very good experience in breast reconstruction and secondary lymphedema and is a good teacher and uh, delivered guest uh, lectures in various uh, uh, conferences and has uh, uh, a good number of uh, publications for his credit and for the last 25 years uh, he is a uh, uh, reconstructive cosmetic and uh, breast oncoplastic surgery. Uh, and uh, lymphatic surgeries. I request Dr. Ashok to deliver the guest lecture. Thank you so much. Um, can you see my s the screen? Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. 
Um, okay, so I, I'll just talk about the basic of breast reconstruction. And uh, before going to the uh, reconstruction itself, let me talk a little about um, the cancer part of it. So everybody, uh, every plastic surgeon should know, and especially the students know about it. So the diagnosis of breast cancer uh, is done on two counts using mammogram and a core biopsy. And FNAC is not a uh, standard of care. You have to do core biopsy to get a proper diagnosis. In mammogram, we can divide the findings into what we call as Birkat uh, scoring. One, two, three are considered benign. Four is considered to be suspicious. Five is considered suggestive. And six is a bi biopsy proven of breast cancer. Why do we do core biopsy? We get more tissue so that we can also check the uh, hormonal status of the, the breast, uh, the cancer tissue so that we can institute new adjuvant therapy uh, in such cases, whether we need to give chemo or uh, we need to give uh, hormonal therapy. It will depend on the ERPR and her new status of the tissue what we uh, harvest. So on, on based on this, we divide uh, the breast cancers uh, biologically into luminal A, which is ERPR positive and HRTNU negative. And uh, as uh, Dr. Raja was telling, we need to look at mito uh, mitotic uh, index, which is K67, which will be less than 10%. Uh, 10%. In such cases, you only give hormonal therapy. These are luminal A and in luminal B, Either it is ER and or PR positive and hurting negative, but here the KI 67 will be more than 15%. And these two, we need to give hormonal therapies. But if you see hurting to positive or hurting to enriched or a triple negative disease, these patients will require proper chemotherapy with chemotherapeutic agents uh, upfront. So, what is the uh, indicate? I mean, what is the importance of all this? We need to look at only luminal A and luminal B early cancers. T1, N0 cancers are taken up for upfront surgery without giving any chemotherapy or hormonal. Rest all of them, the standard of care is to do some uh, anterior chemotherapy and continue with chemotherapy if required. So, as I said, uh, direct surgery only in luminal A and luminal B with a small tumor. Rest all will require chemotherapy. So when, when you see a case like this, we need to examine. Uh, when we examine, we look at which quadrant the tumor is situated, what is the skin involvement, whether there is a tethering of the skin, whether there is beauty orange, or it is a inflammatory a breast cancer. So the skin changes will tell all this. And we need to look at the lump as a fixation to the uh, chest as well. And axilla should be examined and supraclavicular area as well. And signs of lymphedema, which again suggests that there are uh, obstruction to the lymphatics. So these are the uh, some of the clinical findings you need to see before uh, we embark on any kind of reconstructions. So TNM classification, uh, you can go through this in, in, uh, in the books, which is very clearly mentioned. Um, what we need to look at is stage one, which is T1 and N0 is the only uh, in, in certain cases is the only uh, stage or T1 and T2 N0 is the only stage where you can do early, uh, upfront surgeries. Rest all chemotherapy is required and LOBC is locally operable breast cancers, which is an advanced local local uh, cancer, but there is no lymph node metastasis that is T3 T4 lesions with N0 or N plus. These are have to receive some kind of chemotherapy to downstage them before we do surgery. And downstaging will help us to either, uh, um, I mean, to do some kind of breast conservation. So LOBCs can be downstaged by giving chemotherapy to do a um, breast conservation surgery and oncoplasty and not a mastectomy. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of uh, mastectomy and breast conservation surgery? Mastectomy is much more morbid. We do more surgeries. Psychologically better for the patients. They feel that the whole cancer has been removed. Now I won't get it, can, get a cancer back. Um, there is less chance of um, delay in chemotherapy because there is no other uh, uh, surgery done at that time. So uh, the healing will be faster. This is I'm talking about only mastectomy. 
and uh, if reconstruction is needed, the disadvantage is you need a bigger reconstruction as compared to breast cancer, uh, breast conservation itself. And uh, if you do, uh, there is a study which have shown that if you do mastectomy or breast conservation, the chances of lymphedema, whether what you have done to the axillary uh, nodes is independent of that, there is more chance of lymphedema if you undergo mastectomy as well. BCS as compared to that is much smaller surgery. Recovery is faster. Some of them go back on the same day and the recovery is faster. So unlikely to be uh, uh, affecting the um, um, chemotherapy later on. Now, uh, how to decide whether what to do? The first is patient preference provided medically they are fit for both. Patient can decide whether they want this or that. And um, mastectomy is indicated where if there is a locally advanced breast cancer with skin involvement, we need to do a mastectomy and not uh, breast conservation. If it is a multicentric, again, multifocal uh, or multicentric mastectomy is required. And um, if a tumor which has not responded to neoadjuvant, uh, we need to do a mastectomy and not a breast conservation. And any indications uh, which contraindicates radiation, we, uh, sh mas they should undergo mastectomies. Some kinds of uh, 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 connective tissue disorders or patient who have already received radiation, these are some of the contraindications. Rest all of them, if they are medically uh, fit, they, should, they can undergo breast conservation surgeries. So when we see the patients for uh, in the consultation room, some of the history we need to really know about is diabetes mellitus for reconstruction. I'm talking smoking. Smoking is an important thing, especially if you are doing a perforator based uh, free flap or a pedicle flap. Smoking makes a huge difference because this affects microcirculation. And certain uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, if they are given within three or four weeks of reconstruction, there is more chance of um, bleeding that can happen either at the donor site or at the recipient site. So if new adjuvant is given, you need to wait three or four weeks before you, you do the reconstruction. And you also have to do um, bleeding parameters check before you take them up for surgery and make sure that hemoglobin platelets and uh, PTIN are all in normal range before we do this. Examination of the breast should be done. As uh, Dr. Jimmy was telling, you need to check both the breasts, not just uh, the affected side, to look at the, what is the size, the shape, the ptosis, um, which is bigger or which is smaller, uh, what um, quadrant the tumor is situated, uh, and what is the tumor to breast ratio. These are the things you should look at when you do examination. And abdomen um, to check for if you are using abdomen as your donor site, uh, if there are any scars, which any or previous history of liposuction. Uh, so these will prevent you from uh, using abdomen as the donor site. So you need to be. And the build, uh, BMI is an important uh, uh, um, uh, uh, factor in doing certain uh, free flaps, especially dia flaps. Uh, if the BMI is higher, uh, more than 30, you should be careful in, in offering a, a dia flap. And then you need to look at all the secondary sites which are available in case the primary is not available for us. And um, discussion with oncosurgeons, very, very important. What is the prognosis? What is the life expectancy of this patient? It is an important factor for us to decide whether you want to do a primary reconstruction or a secondary reconstruction. Uh, axillary status because once they remove the uh, lymph nodes, there is a chance of providing, I mean, uh, chance of uh, lymphedema developing. So when we can, uh, it helps us to decide whether you want to do a hybrid flap with uh, lymph nodes into the axilla to prevent this kind of uh, complication or um, whether while doing this, whether there is a chance of injury to the, the thoracodorsal vessels which might prevent us from using it as our recipient site. Are there any secondaries anywhere else that needs to be a, a metastatic workup should be done before or the discussion should be done with the oncosurgeons before taking up these fellows for um, uh, reconstruction. And obviously you need to know what uh, surgery has been offered by the oncosurgeon, whether it is mastectomy or breast conservation surgery. So 
when we discuss with the patient, we need to discuss first reconstruction versus no reconstruction. You have to tell them pros and cons of each of them um, because there is a possibility patient might come back and ask uh, why you didn't tell uh, there was no reconstruction uh, uh, option for me not given at all if there is a complication. So always give reconstruction versus no reconstruction, primary versus secondary reconstruction, all the uh, pros and cons of it and implant basis based versus autologous. These are the discussions. Uh, some of that we discussed while presenting the case will let us look at this. So why are we doing this reconstruction? Breast reconstructions are basically a non essential reconstruction for sustenance of life. Uh, but many studies, many systematic reviews, whatever uh, has been uh, done has shown that um, PROMs have been very good when the patient undergoes reconstruction as compared to a non reconstructed uh, uh, mastectomies or uh, BCS. Um, so um, the NIC uh, has recommended that guidelines according to them, the breast reconstruction should be offered to all women undergoing breast cancer surgery. So if you look at literature, most of the studies uh, show this. Um, the, the quality of life, whether it is physical, um, uh, social, psychological, sexual, all uh, quality index are higher when patients undergo reconstruction. So this is one of the points that can be explained to patients who come for reconstruction uh, in favor of getting a reconstruction done. So um, implant based reconstruction, it's very simple off the shelf. Services are available everywhere. Anybody can do it. It's not a, a very specialized uh, a service that is required. It's self, uh, very, I mean, less morbid and no donor site morbid and fa uh, very fast recovery. You can send them the next day. Um, but the, uh, the disadvantage is they behave differently with aging. They, the right and the left breast or, or the breast which is reconstructed as compared to non reconstructed, they behave differently. The one would sag, the other would remain um, uh, upright and firmer. And sometimes if you get radiation, they become really hard, painful, lumpy mass, nowhere near to uh, what an ideal breast should be. And uh, uh, as Jimmy was telling, 30 to 40 percent of them require some kind of uh, revisions at some point of time if they receive radiation. And if you explain, you have to explain this uh, risk of ALCL and squamous cell carcinoma, now the new one that has uh, been detected. You have to explain to the patient before putting an implant into the body. And to uh, uh, a patient who already have one cancer, you tell that there might be another cancer. Um, they, they really, really panic. So these are the uh, advantages and disadvantages of implant based reconstruction. Autologous, any autologous other than a local oncoplasty um, is a major long surgery. Donor site morbidity has to be counted. There are complications we need to explain to the patient and we need to take into consideration. Uh, it's it's most of them are microsurgery. So long uh, the the uh, uh, the down sides of the microsurgery has to be explained to these patients. But the advantage is that the uh, the aesthetics are much better. Uh, it ages better the reconstructed breast. They tolerate radiation well, though um, there are different views on this, but a well vascularized flap, if you put the radiation, uh, doesn't affect too much. And uh, the, the other thing is if you're doing it from the tummy, there is a tummy tuck effect, which most patients are, are uh, happy with. So these are uh, some of the uh, advantages and disadvantages as, as uh, I explained. Um, it's another slide other than that nothing. So basically you need investigations. This is for preparing the patient for uh, surgery. You need hemogram and bleeding and clotting parameters and the X-ray and ECG, uh, this thing. So any routine investigation, what is needed for major surgery you need to do. And the selection of the uh, procedure, mastectomy versus BCS, is as I said, if patient is fit for both, it is patient's decision. You cannot take a, a choice on that. And other things are BMI, smoking, comorbidities like diabetes, 
major heart condition which will prevent them from undergoing major so when we are doing a reconstruction uh, with with a microvascular flap a comorbidities should not be um, i mean should be considered not only with a primary surgery for also re-exploration if is required some of them might uh, tolerate the first surgery but they might not be in a good condition to undergo if there is a complication to undergo a second surgery. So when we are looking at comorbidities, we need to look at both and then decide what we are going to do. Body habitus, uh, uh, basically you need to look at the size of the breast to the volume of the tissue that is available for you to reconstruct. Some of them have a large breast with a very small abdomen or some of them have a small breast with a large abdomen. So all these things needs to be considered when you offer uh, 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 reconstruction to the um, patient again abdominal surgeries previous pregnancies pregnancies actually uh, if if uh, a lscs is done or if it's a vaginal uh, delivery you have very good quality um, excess uh, paniculus available in the lower abdomen which can be used for so this we did um secondary reconstruction what is the advantage of doing a secondary reconstruction as to a primary reconstruction patients have time to decide OK, but uh, it will not inf interfere with chemotherapy. If uh, uh, there is a complication in primary, it might affect the uh, chemotherapy, which is very important for them. Uh, may need a tissue expander and a second anesthesia is needed. And sometimes, sometimes uh, the insurance doesn't cover this. Primary, as I said, it's one stage. Patient goes under one anesthesia and comes out uh, with the breast not lost at all. That means they won't feel the loss. The skin quality, when if you do uh, spin, skin sparing mastectomy or a nipple sparing mastectomy, um, the skin quality is so good, you just need to fill that. So the, the end result or the aesthetic outcomes are much better when there is skin envelope available for reconstruction and insurance covers this. Uh, but the downsize is that since the patient did not leave with a mastectomy uh, defect, they will not might not appreciate the results as much as they would a secondary reconstruction uh, patient would and it is a longer surgery and uh, complication will delay the adjuvant therapy uh, and sometimes the patients are not in the right frame of mind to undergo this because um, as we all know cancer is a major setback in their life and they are trying to deal with that rather than reconstruction so uh, these are the uh, some of the things you need to consider at primary reconstruction so let's look at uh, dia flap and uh, the first history of breast reconstruction uh, was done um, the first one was done by transferring a lipoma from the back to the breast uh, um, area uh, the patient who underwent mastectomy also incidentally had a lipoma and it was done the tram itself was uh, the free tram i'm talking it was uh, done in 1979 uh, though it is uh, credit to, credited to Japanese microsurgeon in 1991 uh, who had done the dia flap, it is Robert Allen and Philip Blondil. Allen was an American, uh, Blondil is from Belgium. They are the ones who actually uh, revolutionized dia flap and, and uh, in the present form. And this was first reported in 1994. So dia flap is the tissue we take from the lower abdomen uh below the umbilicus up to the uh, suprapubic region from both asis and um, mm, th there is some innervation that comes from t11 and t12 there are reports of uh, innervated reconstruction being done now but uh, the outcomes are very very sketchy still the blood supply is what we need to talk about it comes from deep inferior epigastric artery which is a branch of external uh, iliac and uh, the artery runs behind the re uh, rectus muscle superiorly and medially towards the umbilicus. During this course, they divide differently and give a set of medial perforators and lateral perforators. And uh, we can use any of these perforators, medial or lateral. And uh, the size of the perforators vary from 0 0.3 to 1 millimeters. And one perforator is good enough uh, uh, to a large size perforate is good enough to perfuse a uh, large amount of skin in the lower abdomen. The vein is uh, a pair of vena committentes ultimately drain into uh, the same named vein in the pelvis. 
uh, at the um, uh, origin, these artery and vein are very uh, big size, two to four millimeters in size. So uh, large size uh, vessels are available. And if you dissect all the way to the original, uh, the the origin of these uh, vessels, uh, the pedicle length will be something like 15 centimeters. So you get a large um, uh, length as well. So these perfor the the vessel runs behind the muscle, and uh, it gives multiple perforators which arborize in the uh, subcutaneous uh, uh, tissue. And this is the vascular basis of our uh, flap. It paired uh, on either side, superficial uh, uh, inferior epigastric vessels are also present. Uh, and sometimes we use these veins mainly for super draining these flaps. Something got stuck. Hello? Yeah. So we already talked about um, uh, zones. Basically, uh, this was the old one, the heart rams, which we don't use anymore. This is more physiological homes. Zone one is on the ipsilateral rectus. So that is the zone one. It is the primary angiosome. The secondary angiosome would be uh, zone two, which is lateral to this zone up to the ASIS. The third zone is across the midline on the opposite rectus area. And the fourth is beyond that. So generally, if you take one perforator, and most of the time there is good amount of midline crossover. So zone one, zone two and zone three are, are part of zone three are fairly reliable. If you want to use the outer part of zone three and zone four, you have to look at supercharging this flap or taking a second pedicle on the opposite side. And when we harvest uh, a flap from the lower abdomen, uh, there are various varieties of uh, flap that has been described uh, based on the amount of muscle we take. MS0 or muscle sparing zero means it's a tram, free tram flap where you take the full width of the muscle, but you take a short length of it around the umbilicus. So this leads to major abdominal problems because of uh, loss of muscle. There is possibility of um, uh, um, abdominal bulge or, or hernia occurring or um, just getting up from the bed might be a, a painful event or it might become weak. Um, muscle sparing one is lateral segment is spared, the medial uh, segment is harvested. Uh, MS2 is lateral and middle uh, uh, or a medial is spared, means only you take the middle one, lateral and medial are spared. Um, and lastly, MS3 or muscle sparing 3 is uh, diap flap, what we are going to discuss uh, now, where all the muscle is spared, you dissect the perforator through the muscle and leave all the muscle intact along with its nerve supply. So MS, there was a, a large meta-analysis done and what was uh, uh, concluded was that, um, that if you do a diap flap, uh, abdominal morbidity uh, uh, decreases significantly uh, as compared to a free tram, but flap related complications are higher. Uh, but when you do a tram, the um, uh, flap related complications are less, but abdominal uh, complications increase. So you need to uh, weigh that and decide what you want to do. This is an example. Uh, one is a tram and another is uh, uh, a diap. You cannot really make out the difference once you reconsider. This is uh, uh, tram and this is diap. But if you see the abdomen, see this bulge. So this is the complication you can have with uh, a, a tram. So I told about preoperative investigations, but specific for diap, you need a couple of investigations. Uh, mainly CT angiogram, but acoustic Doppler is is not a basic. I mean, investigation uh, uh, as per se, but you, it helps in uh, in planning your uh, flap. And MR angio uh, is a new uh, armamentarium, but uh, it reduces the risk of radiation. But you need specialized uh, um, skills to read that as compared to CT angio. Planning, you no. Know, uh, Basically, we use uh, 
like this, you can get a very good uh, signal on the handled uh, acoustic Doppler of 10 megahertz. But this is as a secondary to uh, CTINGO. We would use this to confirm the presence there where we have uh, identified the CT uh, perforator. Um, so this is how if you look at now, um, we keep watching. This is the umbilicus what you see and you can see a perforator there going both ways. It's going medially and lateral. This is a very good perforator about uh, one millimeter in size and uh, on, on the left side. And if you keep watching, uh, you can see one here as well, uh, which is coming here. See this? This is a big perforator uh, again dividing medially laterally. And in, in sagittal sections, um, what we look at is. See this, this is the perforator coming, but it is communicating with the superficial system. That means most likely you don't need to do a SIEV vein as a super uh, uh, charging, uh, super draining the flap. So it gives a great information about the anatomy of the perforators, where they are situated, how many are there, what you need to harvest. And also it saves time in the theater system uh, inside the theater when you harvest. You don't need to investigate and go up all the perforators what you find to check whether it is the one you want to use or not you use. OK, so planning the skin paddle in the dia flap generally um, depends on where the perforator is situated. If the perforators are situated below the umbilicus, then what we do is we keep the upper border at the level of the umbilicus. The lower one is basically pinchable skin, not necessarily the groin crease. Whatever you can easily pinch, that is the amount you should harvest. If the perforator is above the uh, umbilicus, then you go above, the incision goes above, and naturally this, the lower incision will go higher. Okay, and when you choose a perforator, don't choose perforators uh, like this, which are on the same side, medial and lateral row, because you will damage more uh, muscle and lead to complications. You choose one which are vertically oriented like that's in the same line. So you can spread the muscle without causing damage and you can take more than one perforator if you need. Numbers generally speak, uh, uh, um, a thumb, uh, rule of thumb is you take one perforator which is centrally situated provided it is a sizable, uh, it is sizable uh, um, perforator in the uh, sense that if it is more than one millimeter or 0.8 millimeter, it should be good for it. Again, to decide whether we use one side pedicle or both side pedicle, it depends on what is the amount of tissue which is available in the abdomen as compared to the volume of the breast you want to reconstruct. If one side is not sufficient, the volume of the tissue, then you need to take double a pedicle. Otherwise, you can do from one. SIEV vein, we always harvest SIEV vein and keep it. We might use and we might not use. Lymphatic tissue, this is again not very common, but you can harvest uh, uh, groin vessels here, but that itself involves attaching another SIEV system into the axilla to provide vascularity to the lymph nodes. Personally, I feel uh, they can be done as a separate flaps rather than to do as a hybrid combined flap because orienting the flap and putting it in right position uh, becomes difficult. I feel the breast ride more up and lateral if you if you try to put the axillary nodes into the ax, I mean uh, the groin nodes into the axilla. So basically pinchable skin, lower abdomen and number of perforators you need. So while harvesting, what we do is we incise uh, the skin and this is the uh, SIEV vein. It is very, very superficial. We incise the lower part first. We take 10 minutes and we try and harvest as long as possible. You see that it's already uh, three to four centimeter. We go all the way to the, the origin because we don't want to put vein grafts again into this. So uh, uh, if you take a long length of this vein, uh, we can directly connect it to wherever either it is the connection happens uh, either to the distal end of the IMA vessels or in the axilla some vein we find and connect it. So that if you dissect all the way, you get about seven to eight centimeters of uh, 
uh, the length. Now, when you harvest, uh, when you go, you, the perforator is there. This is the rectus sheath. We have dissected through the per, uh, muscle here, but we preserve all the motor branches. We have to dissect through. We we'll preserve them so that there is no weakness in the rectus sheath. And once we harvest um, one side, what we do is we elevate rest of the flap while the perforator on the opposite side is still connected. This is how we decide how we want to, whether we want to take a second pedicle or not. So what we do is on the opposite side, we clamp the uh, perforator like that and we do something called an ICG scan. ICG scan is indocyanin green. We give intravenous 5 ml, uh, 3 ml and flush it with water, uh, uh, normal saline. And then we look at the perfusion caused by the ipsilateral. You can see here this part is not perfused well. That means this area will not survive on the other side, but one side per uh, pedicle. In such scenario, you see what is the volume available for us. If that is enough, the midline is enough for us to reconstruct the breast, we can do one side pedicle itself. If that is not enough, you need to harvest the zone three, then you need to go back and dissect the other side pedicle as well. So this is how we decide one side or other side, how much skin to take. So then we mark like this, where wherever we see the dark image, we mark and assess whether this is sufficient. No, harvest the other side. Yes, we just cut it and take this off. Abdomen closure. Um, if you be well, well on both sides, we don't need to uh, uh, elevate anymore. Uh, if the tension, if there is tension, you elevate a little more like abdominoplasty and close uh, uh, the abdomen. The, the rectus sheath, uh, I mean, we take a couple of stitches in the muscle and then we just close the rectus sheath with uh, proline and we close the abdomen with subcuticular stitches over a drain and we bring the, uh, the umbilicus out. Now, preparation of the chest. Uh, Dr. Jimmy was telling that how to go about uh, preparing. So beforehand, uh, while planning itself, we plan and mark uh, where is the breast um, footprint and we tattoo it that area. And we, after when they do mastectomy, they always go beyond the inframemory crease. They go all the way to the uh, infraclavicular region and they go into the axilla. So everything has become big. If you put a flap into that, it will flatten out and it will slide into the axilla. So we need to create a breast cavity into which our flap is going to sit. So we re, uh, uh, since we have tattooed, we put um, vicarious stitches and make sure that the axilla is closed, the inframemory crease is created, and we place the flap into this cavity so that it projects for, uh, uh, forwards. Vascular anastomosis, our preferred uh, uh, vessel is internal mammary for various reasons as we discussed. It's a good size vessel. You get one vein and one artery if you do it in the second or third intercostal space. You will get two veins if you do below the third intercostal space. So uh, you can choose where you want to do. Um, the, the negative pressure of the chest wall is a very good uh, suction machine for uh, venous drainage. It helps to suck. And the, the, the vessels are on the surface, okay? So the anastomosis is much easier on the, on the chest wall. Um, the, the disadvantage is that um, there is, we can cause uh, pneumothorax or sometimes, especially on the left side, respiratory and heart movements uh, move the, the vessels after uh, while anastomosing up and down so you need to a little more uh, uh, difficult to do the anastomosis we can use intercostal perforators of the second or third space which are big enough or thoracodorsal thoracodorsal uh, good size vessels if they are not damaged in the axillary dissection you can use it you have to make a second incision in the axilla to do a, 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 a easy anastomosis but um, the main worry is if, if axillary dissection is done and you put a drain there, uh, which is floating and there's a lot of uh, 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 lymph which is oozing, um, it makes me a little uncomfortable to put it in the thoracoid also. Um, the other uh, anastomosis one sometimes we do is uh, super draining. 
we use this lateral thoracic vein or a cephalic flip in in the sub from the infraclavicular region we flip the cephalic vein and do it or we do the distal end of the internal memory vein we'll I'll, I'll discuss that how we do it so these are the advantages i already spoke about uh, internal memory uh, but as uh, we also discussed the cartilage has to be removed in most of the time but if you remove the cartilage if you bank it you can use this for nipple reconstruction later on so sometimes we put a small amount of cartilage in the subcutaneous tissue uh, so that we can put it in the nipple areola so uh, the loss of projection will not happen if in, in the nipple areola um disadvantages intrathoracic i said we have to remove a piece of cartilage pneumothorax is a risk uh, will produce or sometimes may produce contour deformity because of removal of the cartilage uh, transmitted movements of the respiration is there so this is how we do the ima dissection uh, we split the muscle like that in the pectoralis in the second or third uh, costal uh, cartilage um once we uh, we use monopolar for this so there's no bleeding once you reach that uh, cartilage what we do is uh, we use periosteum to elevate uh, the perichondrial flaps on either side like that and uh, once that uh, uh, perichondrium is elevated we use uh, a nibbler bone nibbler to nibble off uh, the cartilage so by removing a piece of cartilage and storing it as i said you can use it later on and once uh, it is all removed uh, the cartilage is removed you will uh, sorry so this is the posterior perichondrium once we release this posterior perichondrium uh, the vessel will be right behind it this is the artery and this is the vein the artery is lateral the vein is medial uh, the, towards the uh, sternum and sometimes as i said if you go lower down you'll get two veins this is artery and two good size veins you will have and uh, the anastomosis is you can do hand even or you can put a, a coupler uh, this internal memory artery internal memory vein this is the flat vein and the artery um, and you have to lie if the pedicle is long you put it in in a such a way that it doesn't cause kinking now additional anastomosis so this is the flap that has been uh, we discussed again right so see the flap it is congested the veins are turgid it is still attached to uh, uh, the main pedicle in such scenarios you need additional drainage of the veins otherwise especially the opposite the zone 3 so what we do is either we use lateral this is the flap vein this is the lateral thoracic vein our oncologists always preserve this vein we tell them to keep it and you can connect it so this reduces the vascular condition second option this is the infra memory uh, this uh, infra clavicular region through the same incision of the mastectomy you can go all the way in the delta pectoral groove dissect the cephalic vein and cut the distal end and bring it here so we can connect uh, uh, the uh, vein here itself and you can do the distal end of imv uh, as well this is uh, internal uh, sorry a perforator you don't need to dissect um, the costal i mean remove the costal cartilage sometimes you get a good size in uh, perforator you can directly connect it especially if the breast volume is not big that means if you are not transferring more than 800 900 cc of the uh, volume you can do it in internal memory i mean internal uh, memory perforator as well so additional anastomosis as we said bilateral pedicle either you can uh, connect like this where one end is connected to uh, the ima the other end is connected to the distal ima or you can connect on the bench you can do this kind of connection to one of the perforators from the opposite uh, pedicle and this you connect it to the ima so these are all ways of increasing the vascular uh, input to the flap now uh, dia flap is a flat flap uh, only skin and fat right so we need to convert that into a breast mount which is has got a projection so um, what we do is before doing the anastomosis we 
uh, make after removing what is not necessary, we make uh, some bench work and uh, take some stitches in the fat to make it look like a breast mold. So if you see this, it, it resembles an, an anatomical uh, implant, uh, breast implant. If you do this and you do the connection and then you resect off whatever skin is required and rest of it you can, uh, uh, what is not required you can resect off and keep only what is necessary. So this is how you create the breast mount and this goes directly into the chest uh, cavity that we have created by taking sutures with the Y grill. This is a small video how uh, we do it. These are the reconfirming the perforator, how we uh, identify here because they are lower down. We have taken the upper border at the umbilicus. These are the lateral border of the rectus, and this is roughly way how the um, diap vessels would run through, and those, those should be the perforators. And you always do this pinch test to see that uh, you will be able to close the skin uh, comfortably without too much of tension. And uh, generally what we prefer to do is use the same side uh, as uh, same side abdomen for the flap basically because the SIEV vein orients itself into the axilla if you do this. Uh, so that's why we use the same side and we uh, dissect the upper and the lower border. and elevate it from lateral to medial side. And we know where the perforator is. So this is all cold zone of the flap, which we can harvest very fast. No need to worry about any perforator and especially lateral to the uh, lateral border of the uh, rectus sheath. And once you see the rectus sheath, if you think uh, you are doing medial perforator, you can still elevate it uh, fast, no problem. If you are planning it on the lateral perforator, you need to be careful. So um, this is the upper border that has been uh, is being dissected. So that's the perforator there. You uh, dissect this through the uh, the rectus sheath is being opened. That's the perforator there. And once you cut that, we have to dissect through the uh, muscle into the um, main vessel like that you dissect all the way this is lateral half this is the medial half and you preserve all these narrows which are there so without causing and then you can elevate the flap uh, from rest of the thing by circumscribing the umbilicus so this is flat flat there is no muscle it looks quite flat so you need to convert it into a breast mount so I will, uh, this is all I, I already showed. This is the anastomosis. This is after anastomosis. Uh, you, uh, so abdomen we showed, uh, if you bevel it, you don't need to uh, elevate it. Otherwise you elevate a little more to close it. Make sure that the uh, abdomen is closed properly so that you don't, uh, uh, there's no tension. On you. So these are the nerves which have been preserved for, for uh, while harvesting the diet. So, so all you need to do is close the anterior sheet that, like that. So that's it. Um, there is no need to do uh, mesh repair or anything. And subcubicular stitches what drains the place. So once the, uh, uh, the uh, we place the breast mount, we see what much how much skin is required. Rest of all is deepithelized like this. You can use scissors, blade, or uh, uh, monopolar depending upon your preference, and uh, rest all is uh, removed. And laterally, what we do is again whatever is required, we keep rest all we knock it off. So one thing, I uh, get good hemostasis um, and you take a stitch there and hitch it to uh, the serratus area so that it doesn't uh, drag laterally and become flatter. So that is one uh, key stitch you need to do so that the projection uh, is maintained of the, of the breast mount what we create.
So then rest all is uh, put inside and uh, the subcuticular stitches are put and this is and you can check uh, the symmetry uh, of the breast and the reconstructed breast and the projection and the process everything can be matched. Post operatively, the dressing is well protected. We put a lot of uh, dinoplast so that there is no tug on the anastomotic side because when you make them stand up, there might be a tug and the, the, the anastomosis can rupture. So you need to be very careful, protect it well and warm fluids and uh, just like any other free flaps, you need to keep the patient warm and IV fluids to be given. And this flap is very, very finicky in terms of temperature. So you keep that, uh, uh, cover that area as well. Low molecular weight heparin we give, but it is more for DVT prophylaxis. Other than that, we don't use anything else. And the drain care is done. We monitor the flap uh, every hourly on the first uh, day and two hour and four hours, second and third day. And second or third day, we mobilize the patients. So monitoring of the flap, is mainly color and temperature, prick test and Doppler. That's what we use. This is how on the perforator, exactly where it was, you get very good signals. You can uh, put a uh, marker there and use that as your, uh, this thing to identify where the perforators are. I mean, uh, where, the, where the signals are coming. And the scratch test, uh, you all know how, how we do it. Just scratch and see that it is good. Uh, bright bleed and not dark bleed and uh, that's nice bleed that is coming on the second third day. so that's what you need to look at some results uh, i feel the best re best results are when you do nipple sparing or a skin sparing mastectomy you just need to put that much volume into the envelope already present it gives excellent result uh, even see this uh, bilateral one, it's much more easy to do because you divide the abdomen into two halves and then you cover it. Uh, I mean, put it inside, uh, they, get, they match themselves, not too much of a problem. Uh, this is nipple sparing on one side and skin sparing on the other side. And this was a BRCA positive patient who underwent uh, this thing. See, the, the, the result, it's, it's almost normal bre looking breast except for the incision. Uh, uh, though the symmetry is good, unless we create nipple areola, there might be some uh, disturbance in how they look. Next best is when we have a uh, normal mastectomy. So however we do, there is always a difference in right and left when there is uh, modified um, mastectomy, a radical mastectomy that is done. However, if you, if you uh, do a good job, they should match fairly well. This is a secondary reconstruction patient uh, underwent. Um, she came like this. Somebody said we will do a second reconstruction and preserving the nipple areola. We were expanding the skin and during that period uh, she uh, tested for BRCA and it came positive and she panicked and said I want a re uh, mastectomy on the other side immediately. Uh, however, explanation, uh, good explanation we did. We have to still expand that skin. So when you do secondary reconstruction and put an implant, you need to over expand to account for the ptosis of the opposite side. So over expansion is required, but in this case she was very adamant we go and do the reconstruction and uh, this is a uh, bilateral um, diap which uh, we had to do. The skin panels are at different levels, but overall the symmetry is fairly uh, good though it is slightly the right is slightly smaller than the left, which probably we would have uh, expanded and done a better job. But this is the uh, uh, case we removed the implant. So when, when we plan for uh, breast reconstruction, we mark the breast footprint. We don't put flap anything above this. If you put flap above this, the supraclavicular area will there will be fullness. So you start your flap here and it comes down. That's why we, we always mark the boost, uh, breast footprint and we tattoo it and we try and put the flap into that area itself. This is where we remove the implant and uh, uh, and the reconstruction was done like this. Complication, anastomotic complications, like any other free flaps, you can have arterial or venous complications. Generally, diaphlaps have more venous problems than that. That's why we need additional venous drainages as an option available for us. Abdominal complications are 
uh, rare in diaphragm flaps, uh, but can happen. There are uh, people who use uh, a small mesh inside the rectus sheath. Um, they are doing that now to prevent abdominal uh, abdominal problems. I haven't used uh, anything like that. Asymmetry is a major uh, issue. Uh, and this is pre uh, uh, CT angio era. See this, there was no midline crossing. Uh, this is the time when we were doing directly diap. Uh, though the flap was OK on the uh, side, just opposite to uh, uh, just outside of the midline. Absolutely no vascular. So these kind of problems you can prevent by doing a CT angio. And um, this is a venous problem, uh, early venous problem. We had to explore this patient and uh, do a, uh, revise the venous uh, uh, anastomosis. And asymmetry. This lady has a large breast, doesn't want to do anything to this, and she wanted us to match the opposite breast. We took both sides uh, abdomen, so abdomen also is not really very aesthetic. Um, we took large amount of tissue from the abdomen, and we took bipedical. Both pedicles were used. Still, we are not able to match. Maybe with little time, it might sag a little and match, but at present, it is not um, doing that. So you need to explain to the patient if there are large totic breast, we will not be able to match it to the opposite side. You might have to undergo some kind of uh, revision on the normal side. Uh, lastly, NAC creation. Um, very few in our uh, series opt for NAC. Most patients are very, very comfortable with the symmetry, with the clothes on. That is what they are looking for. Um, if they wear their normal clothing and the, the breast doesn't have asymmetry, the appearance of the chest, they are very, very happy. Um, what we do is a C called CV technique. Usually after six to nine months after radiation, if they have received, Otherwise, six months is good, and uh, we do a little bit of tattooing for the color. This is a lady. Uh, this is the CV flap. Uh, it is um, um, how the planning is. This part we deepitalize. This is the flap we elevate. So what we do is uh, we elevate the the whole flap is based on this much of uh, blood supply. So elevate this much of skin like this and use this as the nipple and this and this flap will wrap around this like this and this produces the nipple projection and this skin edge will go there and this will go there and it will close like a uh, vertical line here and rest of it either we can put a small skin graft or we allow it to heal secondarily and then we do tattooing of this So, yeah. So another case where nipple areola has been reconstructed and uh, um, tattooed with uh, pigmentation she has, and this lady is awaiting pig, uh, tattooing for for. It gives fairly good uh, projection, provided you put a small uh, cartilage piece inside. Otherwise, over a period of time, this becomes flat. So that's what we do. Autologous reconstruction, other options. There are uh, various flaps that have been prescribed and not going to detail. Uh, you just need to very rarely uh, done, provided there is no uh, tissue in the abdomen for us to harvest. Otherwise, diap is, is the primary flap. You can do pedicled uh, or a free tissue transfer. So these are the, the, the various flaps that are available. And some of it we discuss the advantages and disadvantages. And uh, LD sometimes if the breast volume is small and uh, there is enough tissue in the back, you can do an extended LD itself as a um, uh, donor for reconstruction. In normally we can uh, orient the skin paddles into transverse oblique or vertical, but in our uh, culture we should do transfer so that we can hide the um, scar. And skin is what is pinchable only. We should take and close this primarily. We can harvest large amount of fat will be there uh, in the 
infrascapular region, this region in, in uh, our population. So we can harvest all that fat and we can take all muscle all the way here and be well and take fat here. Uh, see, this uh, is the amount of fat that you can harvest skin pedal. This is the muscle. So fairly big uh, uh, amount of tissue can be taken. And if you uh, detach the muscle, it will nicely the, the uh, insertion. It will move nicely into uh, the breast area. This is a lady who underwent uh, complete mastectomy uh, and uh, we can do mastectomies like this uh, nipple sparing mastectomy in the lateral breast crease uh, in a small breast like this. So we can use the same one to uh, transfer the flap as well from LD. This is the post-op picture of the same lady uh, who has undergone total reconstruction with LD. So you can do this in, in small A cup size breast and this is the scar. If you see this, is, this fullness is gone here. There is depression. There is depression here. So there will be the price to pay is asymmetry in the in the back for um, um, this is the back view of the same patient. This is the front view. You can see uh, what has happened. Hello. 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 So that. Uh Huh, that com that completes uh, diap and um, other options for me. Um, where are we? Eight fifteen. Uh, do you want me to yeah. do the breast conservation and yeah. oncoplasty, or uh, should I stop? Mm. Oh, how much time it will take? Um, another maybe twenty minutes. Okay. Uh, lymphedema session is there? Uh, that uh, lymphedema. I will do it as a separate one, one because I need. I will. I'll need a full session for that because uh, prevention and uh, treatment would take a long time to do. Um, so I will do uh, that as a separate session in some other time. That's what we discussed. Uh, yes, yes. So shall I go ahead and do the uh, oncoplasty part? OK, you carry on. Yes, I'll show. I'm, I'm, I'm just. So the second part, I mean, um, uh, way of reconstructing breast after breast cancer is something called oncoplasty. What has happened is that uh, the treatment of cancer, uh, breast cancer has changed from maximum tolerable, tolerable treatment to minimum effective treatment. And along with that awareness among the general public and screening programs, we are seeing more and more early breast cancer. So what will happen is that um, uh, uh, patients are asking for uh, breast conservation uh, because it is and it is possible to do breast conservation. Um, so. Breast conservation has led to oncoplasty, so now there are many papers which tells that breast conservation is as good as mastectomy in terms of uh, survivability, although there is a small increased risk of local recurrence. Um, and new paper from uh, uh, Dutch, they have shown that the survivability is better with PCS. This is what the new study is showing. So, but if you do only breast conservation without doing a oncoplasty, this is what we'll end up with. Very cortex uh, breast, which is not good at all aesthetically. And in fact, uh, it is better to have a good mastectomy. Uh, hello? Slides uh, are sorry, not visible, ma'am. Slides are not visible. Uh, it is not, not visible. visible? Oh, no, just, just, yes, give me, yes, just give me a minute. Let me share once more. I shared. Ashok, slide uh, share. You do it. I think it will be all right. Now? No, no, no. Okay, not, not yet. yet. Sir. Not yet. Wait, not wait. Yet. Let me close. Let me close this and start again. I think. Uh, Now, 
no no not at ashok Not I just, uh, I don't know what. Mm -hmm. Just, I don't know what happened. Open, not there. Still not seen? No. No, not it. Not it. Not seen, sir. Not yes. seen. Would you like to ask anything? Ha <laughs> ha. You unmute and ask. I cannot, I don't know why. I can see my slide here. Uh, Dr. Ashok, I think it's hard to wait. Sorry? Close the session and again share it. Got to join us. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. So what I was telling is um, because uh, breast cancer as uh, uh, treatment has changed from maximum tolerable treatment to minimum effective, along with that awareness of and uh, among general public and screening programs, has led to a number of uh, uh, operations available called breast conservation surgery. And that has led to something called hormoplasty. And it has shown that PCS actually uh, is as good as mastectomy in terms of uh, life uh, preservation. So there is a small increased risk of local recurrence. That's what uh, it's been found. And um, new studies have shown it even, it's even better than mastectomy in terms of summary. But if you do BCS only without doing uh, oncoplasty, this is what we'll end up with very bad. Had, uh, aesthetic results. Uh, it is not. It is not better than mastectomy at all. So, um, so this is where oncoplasty came. What is oncoplasty? It's application of plastic surgery techniques. It can be more than one procedure. At the time of removal of the breast, uh, with immediate breast uh, reshaping, without compromising on oncoplastic principle, onco oncologic principle. That means you have to excise the tumor completely with free margins. At the same time, don't remove unnecessary things and reconstruct with using any plastic surgery techniques available for us. So the general principle is you need to remove uh, wide. You have to do wide excision. Uh, some people think that you have to remove just from below the skin if skin is not involved all the way to the muscle. But the new concept is whatever you remove, the margin should be tumor free. That's all that is required, I believe. And uh, you have to undermine the skin uh, and the gland and close it. And uh, you have to close it in a layer so that you don't leave cavity. One of the things that was thought about uh, doing uh, BCS in initial stages, they left a cavity to fill it with seroma. 
and initially the the cosmosis looked very nice because it was filled with zero and uh, as radiation was uh, given and as time went by because the serum of cost fibrosis it led to major aesthetic so you should not leave any cavity for serum water formation sometimes we have to replace the, the nipple areola to the apex of the breast mound we have created or sometimes it's good to drain this and uh, skin closure has to be done depending upon the complexity of the uh, procedures we have classified them into class 1 class 2 and class 3 class 1 is simple closure which uh, most of the onco surgeons only do class 2 it requires a little bit of training uh, as we discussed tissue displacement like benelli a mammoplasty techniques or therapeutic mammoplasties and uh, tissue replacement like lda and perforator flaps and class 3 what we call as extreme uh, oncoplasties or microvascular flaps but in terms of how we do these flaps there are two varieties volume displacement for lesions which are have very small a uh, tumor to breast ratio that means the tumor is small the breast volume is very big in such cases we can just mobilize the rest of the breast and cover it up so it's a simple closure we can uh, use the local tissue uh, and use it in volume replacement we have to borrow tissue from somewhere else either locally or from the distant area so what are the advantages of the local uh, volume displacement it's a local surgery we are not violating beyond the breast so flaps are always there for us but it's a little and there is no donor site but asymmetry happens if you see this breast it, it has underwent a benelli mastopexy overall if you look at this as an isolation the result is very good but if you look at the other breast there is some asymmetry or reduction in the volume. this is very much so with all volume displacement unless the the resection is very very small and the breast is very large and uh, as the volume increases the resection the cosmosis decreases it's not good for all quadrants and small breast we cannot do this kind of thing volume replacement advantage is symmetry can be achieved exactly match to the opposite breast any breast you can use it in big or small doesn't matter disadvantage is there is donocyte morbidity from wherever we borrow the tissue that tissue that uh, causes some scarring for there and if you use an ld or something like that vital donor site is expended very early in li uh, life if there is recurrence then there is no tissue for us and ld and all we have to change position so it takes more time to do it and certain defects in the superior medial quadrant very difficult to get flap into reaching this area so it is very difficult to do replacement in such so let us look at some volume displacement benelli is a periareolar incision we make basic principle is that you make a uh, incision around the uh, um, uh, this thing uh, nac go and remove the tumor in a sector manner like wherever it is you need to remove a sector of the you have to imagine the sector of a circle and remove it and you get two breast pillars this side and this side you mobilize them and close it if the nipple is falling into this region you have to Uh, push and relocate the nipple to the new center of the breast that's all is the principle of this procedure here is an example superior uh, this is the tumor there uh, if the nipple area complex is small you can excise a donut like that and go from here reach the tumor remove the tumor uh, in a sector fashion like this so you get two pillars medial and lateral or superior and inferior pillars mobilize them and close it and put a drain and close it this is what happens the tumor that has been removed except for the periarterial incision you will not see anything and if the volume is small absolutely no problem at all the 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 end result is very good this is called a benelli technique if skin is involved or the tumor is very close to the skin so where they have to uh, sacrifice then what we do is we remove the skin as well but when you remove the skin in certain quadrants you have to excise it in a radial fashion and not a semi circular fashion here we have excised the, the skin and the tumor in a radial fashion again same mobilize the pillars and close it this is what we do to relocate the nipple area to the center of the mold de epithelize and push it pre op this is uh, immediate post op and this is Uh, the lateral view this is the scar and this is uh, how uh, uh, centralization is done 
So this is the same lady. This is uh, early post-op and this is a late post-op. This is uh, the nipple area. Look at the scar, it has healed very well. And this is the uh, scar of the AC reposition. This is how it will be in uh, class one or Hello, somebody's mic is on. Can you switch it off, please? So another variety of um, um, oncoplasty is uh, in the volume displacement is what we call as therapeutic mammoplasty. If the tumor is situated in where we normally excise when we do this kind of breast reduction, then all we need to do is a breast reduction and remove the tumor, which is anyhow we are discarding the tissue. So here is an example. Here is the uh, tumor in the superior quadrant, planned and inferior pedicle uh, mastopexy. And this is the inferior pedicle. We are removed the tumor and this is the post-op picture. You get uh, advantage of doing uh, a mastopexy and reduction as well, and you get the advantage of doing uh, um, tumor resection. And this is pre-op, immediate post-op and late post-op. Patients have excellent results over uh, years of time. They they do very well. So you can. This is what I said. Applying principles of uh, plastic surgery to uh, breast conservation is oncoplasty. Is another example. If you see this lady, she has got a tumor in the inferior quadrant here. But if you see her breast, this is at a, the nipple areola is at a slightly higher level, and this is at a lower level. All you need to do is a mastopexy kind of incision vertical mastopexy, you relocate the nipple areola higher up and remove the tumor in, in, in a vertical scar fashion. That's the tumor that has been removed. And pre and the post-op, uh, you have matched the nipple area, the breast size, everything. At the same time, you have taken care of the tumor as well. In some cases where the tumor is away from the zone of excision in uh, breast reduction, here, the tumor is way high up here in somewhere there. So then what we can do is we can do either an extended pedicle or a secondary pedicle to fill this. So here is a superior medial pedicle. This is how we would do, but you take extra tissue beyond that. And when we rotate this nipple, this tissue will go and sit into the cavity of the tumor and fill that cavity. See, this is normal superior medial pedicle. This is the extended pedicle what we have taken. And when we flip it, this will go into the tumor cavity and the rest of it is like an abdominal, I mean, um, mastopexy pre-op. Uh, and this is how it would uh, close vertically. And this is the post-op immediate. And uh, the same lady we I showed, uh, we had done surgery on the left side. And this is immediate after radiation. You can see how uh, good the the matches onto the opposite side. In certain situation where the nipple area, uh, the tumor is under the nipple area or nipple area, like a pages disease, nipple area is involved. Uh, if the tumor size is small, we can do something called a grisotti. Grisotti is nothing but an inferior pedicle without the nipple areola. The new nipple areola is formed by the lower half of the breast itself. This is the area we keep as a NAC. Rest all is islanded and deepithelized. We cut here, we cut here, use this and move it upwards uh, like this. The, the, the blood supply to this comes from intercostal perforators in the fourth or fifth intercostal space, and you close it like this. And this is what happens immediate, I mean, after healing. And uh, this is the pre operative picture and this is the post operative picture. Um, this you can produce a nipple and tattoo it, you will get excellent results. This is called a uh, Grisotti technique of doing a central quadrant defects. Now we look at some volume replacements. Locally, we have multiple intercostal perforator flaps or a lateral thoracic artery perforator flap or thoracodorsal uh, uh, artery perforator flaps. These are all perforator based flaps or regional flaps. We can use an LD or a mini LD. Uh, or we can use free flaps as well as a replacement. This is required when the volume of the tumor is more than uh, reaching the 30, 40 percent or more than 20 to 40 percent. You have to do 
replacement. If it is less than 20%, you can do a volume displacement technique. So multiple perforators are viable, uh, MI cap, A cap, anterior intercostal, medial intercostal, lateral intercostal, lateral thoracic, and thoracodorsal pedicle itself. And uh, this is an example of doing a LD flap. This is what we used to do be, uh, before. Now we don't do it anymore. If the volume in the central quadrant is big, you take an LD. Uh, LD, we all know how to do it. We take extra muscle, you fold it and fill that cavity and that's how it will sit. And this is the pre-op and uh, a post-op picture of the same patient. It gives excellent volume and cosmesis mm -hmm. as well. Sometimes if the skin is not involved and they remove only uh, the, the tumor from inside, we can only take muscle and the fat from that area and we can use that and fill that cavity. It's called a filler LD flap except for the scar there, nothing else will be visible. So you can use LD as, like this as well. TDAP flap is a slightly uh, sophisticated uh, flap from the same thoracodorsal pedicle. Usually the perforator is about seven centimeters from the axillary fold and uh, about three centimeters from the anterior axillary and uh, uh, anterior border of the uh, latissimus dorsi. You can take large amount of skin paddle exactly like an LD uh, only the fat and the skin can be harvested. Here is the tumor, upper outer quadrant. It's very good for this, this quadrant defects. This is the tumor that has been removed and this is the flap and uh, skin has been deep. <laughs> we just flip it on the thoracodorsal perforator. This is the thoracodorsal vessel and one perforator is used to fill that cavity. This is the pre-op and this is the post-op picture. You can use thoracodorsal all the way almost to the medial quadrant and the central quadrant. This much area, you can cover it up by using a thoracodorsal flaps. This is another example. Uh, you can do LD or uh, TDAP according to whatever convenience you have, large defect. See, except for this incision and the incision there, uh, the, the breast right, uh, right, the operated side or the other side, it's very, very uh, difficult to make out. LTAP is lateral thoracic artery a perforator flap. Lateral thoracic artery arises from uh, the axillary artery or the subclavian artery, runs along the lateral border of the uh, lat um, pectoralis <coughs> minor, and by fourth or fifth intercostal spa space, it disappears. Only thing is, in about 10% of the people, the artery is not there, so you need to be careful. The, the flap itself is harvested in the same area, where uh, thoracodorsal artery a perforator flap is harvested, but the perforator is such much more anterior. That means it's the mid axillary line. So when you flip or when you take, you can dissect more length uh, towards the muscle. So that's the advantage of doing it. Um, other than that, because um, if you dissect it to the parent vessel again, you can flip and you can transpose. So the reach is also good. Sometimes it reaches mid uh, breast level as well. So this is an example of the tumor that has been removed. And this is how we close it, the LTAP, uh, the pre and the post-op uh, of the same patient. This is the LTAP amount of skin that has been harvested. The uh, Here we are not taken uh, the thoracodorsal, we are not split the muscle, we have gone beyond muscle. This is the thoracodorsal uh, LTAP vessel. So it's an axial vessel there, which is there. So this is the pre-op and the post-op picture and, and the scar. This is how it would look uh, after doing the surgery. So LTAP is also good provided they are not damaged while harvesting or are doing a axillary node dissections. So you need to be very careful. Even with sentinel node, sometimes there is a damage to uh, the uh, LTAP vessel. We need to be very, very careful about that before planning this uh, Light cap is lateral intercostal perforator. So along the mid axillary line from third to sixth intercostal space, uh, there are good perforators which are um, present. And we can use one or more of these perforators to cover defects in the lower outer quadrant of the breast. This is L cap. This was one of the first flaps described, uh, perforator flap described for reconstruction of the breast. How do we do it? First, you do mark the tumor then you mark the anterior axillary line, then you mark 
access incision how we are going to remove the tumor we are going to do remove the tumor by putting this lateral breast incision and then you identify perforators very close to that and here it is the uh, third and fourth intercostal space and you can um, mark the skin in a um, trapezoid way uh, with a tapering end so you can close primarily without causing dog earring and you can harvest a little bit of extra fat there so that it will fill the cavity so this is a, a lady who had tumor in the upper out i mean lower outer quadrant that's the tumor this is the skin incision we applied and around the perforator is the hot zone rest all cold zone this is the fat we harvest this is the harvested um, flap and this is the pre-op of the patient and this is the post-op and this is the scar you would get so you can take if you are flipping you can use all perforators they are all in one line so you can use it if you are propelling it that means if you are using it for skin cover as well you have to harvest it on one perforator you can't use more than one if you use more than one it will twist among themselves and cause vascular problems so anterior intercostal perforators are uh, below the inframammary crease in the sixth uh, intercostal space along the meridian of the breast so two or three perforators are usually present and using this as a uh, vascular basis we can take skin flap from just below the inframammary crease and use to reconstruct central lower quadrant breast uh, defects so that is the area you can cover with anterior intercostal perforators and um, i think it's a small video this is the tumor and this is the flap we have uh, planned and that's the perforator so you can identify with on table with uh, uh, doppler after removing the tumor what we do is we incise the skin the skin should not the paddle should not be too much you should be able to close primarily and you can take more fat from the lower upper abdomen so you bevel it and take more fat and uh, from the rectus sheath you can elevate it from in caudal to cephalic end so when you elevate you can see the perforator there you can see that that's the perforator we are going to base it on uh, keeping that intact you can dissect all around it to uh, release the fat so that it reaches uh, the defect so that's all defected and any de-epithelize you can see good bleeding from the skin and you can all this we have done icg to reconfirm and remove the dark areas so that we can prevent fat necrosis and you can see the perforator there high nicely highlighted in icg there and remove all the unwanted uh, or hyperperfuse flap we convert it into a ball of tissue and we can put it back into uh, the cavity that has been uh, left behind due to tumor resection and you close it off and this is the post-op picture of the same patient and nice lower pole fullness even and when they lie down also you can see the lower pole fullness and this is the scar very well hidden scar in the inframary crease the pre and the post-op picture of it so this is very good for lower quadrant defects but the volume is not good if it's very totic breast you can't do it because it will pull the nipple areola towards it and produce some sort of bird beak appearance in, in, in areas where you need skin, you have to per, uh, base it on one perforator, flip it, and you can cover like that if, if you uh, want to do skin cover as well. And medial intercostal perforator is for medial defects uh, based on internal memory perforator on the rectus sheet. This is the perforator. And we flip the whole thing like this. This is the perforator there. And uh, this is the pre-op. This is the planning. And this is the post-op of the same patient. Hardly anything you can make out that the surgery has been done for her. And another case of same one. This is the uh, scar there. Even when the skin is involved, you can do a uh, flap like this called medial intercostal perforators. So that, those are the, there are actually two perforators here, but if you don't want skin, you can flip it. If you want skin, you need one. In certain areas of the breast, especially upper medial quadrant, very, very difficult to reconstruct these kind of breast because if you bring tissue from the lateral or inferior, the path through which it travels will produce bulging there and the symmetry is lost. 
in such scenarios, we use uh, free flaps uh, to reconstruct. This area is also called no man's zone in uh, breast conservation surgery. It's very, very difficult to do. Uh, uh, the first preference for us is tug flap. This is a uh, phylloids in the upper medial quadrant. Uh, that is the tumor they have removed and uh, a small tug has been uh, harvested. We eyeball and take same amount of tissue and uh, this is the perforator we have used. Uh, the, the perforators are very good and the, 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 the for a small flap they are quite okay. And uh, the perfusion pressure will be very, very good. Look at the amount of bleeding uh, we get when we dissect it. So you do the anastomosis and, uh, and uh, release the clamps and this is the flap sitting outside. All you need to do is see, keep a small uh, skin uh, paddle for monitoring uh, paddle and rest all which sorry. Rest all we need to uh, fill it, push it back into the cavity and fill it. And we close it with a skin same monitoring paddle. So it gives excellent result. Uh, post operator. This is the pre op and this is the post op. Almost uh, similar appearance except for the scar there. CR also can be done. This is an example how we can do CR. Uh, but only thing is, in 20% of patients, artery is absent, so you need to be careful. You need to operate or do a CT angio to get this. Superficial epigastric uh, artery, uh, vein, and uh, artery are used here. Same way. And this is the pre-op and this is the post-op. After radiation, the scar also matures very, very well. You hardly can make out that he underwent a breast conservation with a free flap uh, reconstruction. Uh, and this is a large breast where she didn't want other breasts to be touched. A tug flap like this will give excellent result. So there was slight big breast and it's matched now to the opposite side. Sometimes we have to do combined procedure, ancillary procedure, large, um, uh, phylloids, an young unmarried girl, and uh, however we explained about all the reconstruction, she didn't want the other breast to be touched, and she wanted one be uh, implant-based reconstruction. Being an unmarried girl, uh, we put uh, under uh, the prepec or a post uh, a retropectal or under the muscle. And we also used serratus fascia to cover most of the areas, except for the lateral area. And this is what we landed up with. Uh, a, a breast which is much smaller and not to the shape. After a year, we have uh, reduced this breast and we have done a lipofill to this area and uh, got fairly good match. And uh, uh, she's happy with the results. So what I would say is um, oncoplasty is not one technique. It is application of plastic surgical principles in breast conservation surgeries to achieve uh, a good is a good symmetry without going into mastectomy and reconstruction. So these are two um, uh, spectrum of uh, reconstructive options that are available for uh, plastic surgeons. Although I have not covered uh, implant based reconstruction uh, in detail, that's another uh, this thing since we don't do too much and you just need to know about pros and cons of that. And uh, unless people uh, ask for it specifically, I think it should be avoided because of the late complications and the number of complications they're going to have. Um, with that, I finish uh, today's talk. And uh, if there are any questions, I would uh, be happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Ashok, sir. It was really phenomenal presentation. A lot of learning, very exhaustive ones. Okay. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Actually, Dr. Lakshmi had to leave for an important meeting. Okay. That's why I am here. Sure. Any questions there? It was really a wonderful session. I can say it was more than three hour session. Very exhaustive and long. 
I think, yeah, I think uh, started at yes, 30, I think, right? Yes, sir. It is more. It is more than three hours yeah. now. It is yeah. 10 to 9. I thank okay. all the our faculty, Dr. Ashok, sir, and our moderators, Dr. Raja, Dr. Jimmy Matthews, Dr. Antheshwar. Dr. Dinkar presented very well, confidently. I thank him all also. And I especially thank all the attendees and the delegates who spared their time this evening. That's a weekend evening. They spared their precious time. Anything anyone wants to say at the end? Any of the attendees? I think Dr. Ashok's work, what is the, uh, the body of work itself speaks. I don't think we don't have to. <laughs> the yes, questions. Sir, yes, sir. It was really phenomenal. A lot of <laughs> learning, a lot of learning. Yeah, he's been very patient in explaining everything. The yes, sir. Breast reconstructive uh, microsurgeon here. So we are very happy to and pr privileged to have him in our department. <laughs> it was our privilege and honor today to have an interaction with him and to have in this platform that a plus quest. So I thank you all from the team Plasticus. Thanks yeah. a lot. Good night. Thank you. Then good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Good. Good night. Bye.